This is the story of Chajin Hyuk, the strongest necromancer. However, he was betrayed by his friends because he's a virgin loser. But, after reincarnating, he's now determined to lose his virginity. Um, I mean he's determined to get his revenge. This video is like gold is 500. I would greatly appreciate it if we reach it. Oh, and if this is your second or third time watching one of my videos and you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and do it for your boy. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the story. Cause this shit is fire. A transformation had taken place within the world. It wasn't an ordinary occurrence like shifts in tectonic plates or volcanic eruptions. Monsters, inexplicably, began to manifest across the globe, propelling the world to the brink of annihilation and the entity enabling their appearance, the enigmatic realm that bestowed these creatures with power and dominion. It's referred to as the Devil's Tower or God's Tower. The rationale behind this nomenclature is due to the deities that inhabit these towers who conveyed a message to all humans urging them to ascend the tower. Inside awaits everything they could ever desire. Power, wealth and prestige. Ascend the tower and we shall gratify your wishes. Overcome the trials we've set before you. A colossal tower spanning 999 floors. The entities governing this domain are gods and demons. Governments worldwide endeavored to prevent people from approaching the tower, yet no one could impede individuals from challenging it. In accordance with the deity's decree, those who obstructed others from facing the tower faced retribution. It has been five years since billions began taking notice of the tower. A man with alabaster hair and violet eyes, adorned with a self-assured grin, eagerly readies himself to embark on humanity's inaugural endeavor to conquer the 600th floor. He stands resolute before countless entities. Amidst a grand explosion, the man dauntlessly questions how the Nine Star dared to halt him. Amongst the myriad challengers, nine individuals stood above the rest, wielding magic and divine energy they acquired within the tower, their might unrivaled. The star known as the Dark Star, or the Death Star. He wasn't a master of weaponry, nor a superhuman, yet he was the one who surpassed the Nine Star, attaining the title of the Mightiest. His name is Cha Jin Hyuk, the harbinger of death, the embodiment of death, the preeminent necromancer. As our main character Jin Yuk calls forth his skeletal soldiers, he informs the Nine Star that he had grown weary of peace and humanity, as all he yearns for is strength. He asserts that he shall employ them as summoned beasts to achieve greatness. A white-haired man clutching a tome asserts, We of the Nine Star have no recourse but to vanquish the traitor, Cha Jin Yuk. Although Cha Jin Yuk defected and assaulted the Nine Star after becoming consumed by power, he was incapable of single-handedly overcoming the entire group. Cha Jin Yuk, the apostate who exchanged loyalty for might. However, this narrative is merely the one the world knows. The reality is that Cha Jin Yuk didn't betray humanity. In truth, he was betrayed by eight of the Nine Star. This verity remains concealed from the world. A decade having transpired since then, a man awakens in an apartment. His fury manifests as he vociferates his intent to confront the Nine Star and denounces them as scoundrels. He claims that his covert ability, soul transmission, had indeed functioned. At the precipice of death, this spell permits him to transfer his soul into a suitable vessel. Jin Hyuk observes that it seems to have located a body resembling his own, and he's still situated in South Korea. Enraged by the memory of how he could have conquered the 600th floor unaided, only for the Nine Star to ostensibly support him and then betray him, Jin Hyuk flashes back to a moment when he inquired why they had turned against him. A paladin named Cain and a saintess named Carmen defiantly faced him. Carmen avowed that though Jin Hyuk might be dubbed a one-man army, he paled in comparison to them individually. Jin Hyuk responded that his intention was merely to assist, but Cain rebuffed him, asserting it wasn't a personal matter. They harbored no ill sentiment towards him. Cain, with a disdainful expression, menacingly suggested that Jin Hyuk was merely pulling weeds. Jin Hyuk inquired about Choi Gyung Hoon, wondering if he was aligned with them. Gyung Hoon was the combat star among the Nine Star and Jin Hyuk's friend, who opted out of the 600th floor challenge. Jin Hyuk speculated whether they concealed the truth from Gyung Hoon, fearing he'd side with him. As his vision dimmed due to substantial blood loss, 
Jinyuk ruminated that it was his demise. He'd sacrifice himself for them all. However, he cautioned them against presuming this would signify the end, as he vowed to return stronger for vengeance. In the present, Jin Hyuk's fury endures, and he resolves that he won't merely subject them to servitude as his summoned beasts. He's determined to obstruct any potential for their rebirth. Suddenly his phone rings, and Jin Hyuk experiences a hint of delight, having not utilized one in some time. His expression swiftly morphs into one of shock and terror as he realizes it's the year 2023, signifying ten years have elapsed. For him, it felt like a fleeting instant. He ponders whether he can wield magic in this body. Spotting a fly, he decides to eliminate it, endeavoring to resurrect it as an undead, but fumbling in his attempts. Despite multiple efforts, he remains unsuccessful. His countenance reflects disappointment as he discerns not a trace of mana within this form. He contemplates whether this signifies he must ascend the tower devoid of any usable skills. Swiftly consulting his phone, curious whether they've reached the tower's apex in the past decade, he discovers they've only scaled 200 floors. He perceives this as an opportunity. While they leisurely progress, he intends to catch up and exact his revenge. External training proves futile, necessitating his immediate departure. Though his physique may resemble that of a novice, he possesses the wisdom of the Death Star, Chajin Yuk. He's determined to leverage this knowledge to swiftly amass strength. Outside the Soul Tower entrance, a throng gathers, some aspiring to ascend and amass riches, while others dissuade them by predicting first-floor fatalities. This is the place where aspirations and narratives converge. The Tower. He's finally returned, he vows in the name of Chajin Yuk, resolute in making his presence known. As the tower's entrance swings open, a rush of entrance ensues. In the midst of this, our MC strides forward confidently, announcing the commencement of his retribution. Upon entering the tower, Jin Hyuk finds himself teleported to the tutorial stage. Reflecting on the time that has passed, he realizes it's been 15 years since his last visit. He notes that this place offers a level of difficulty unmatched anywhere else, an arduous path laden with traps that require days to traverse. Among ten floors, this one is often considered the most formidable. A system materializes, presenting him with a challenge. Navigate through traps to reach the destination. Damage sustains can be healed either upon reaching the destination or returning to the starting point. Curious about his new body's attributes, Jin Hyuk opens his status window, only to be met with disappointment due to the dismal stats. Observing that he now possesses gluttony and mana-related stats, he ponders whether traits and physical talents differ among souls. Grinning confidently, he resolves to maximize his gains from the tutorial. With determination, he races into the treacherous path ahead. However, as he leaves the starting point, a series of magical arrow traps activates. While he manages to evade some, multiple arrows appear behind him, and despite dodging several, he ends up getting hit multiple times. Despite the pain, Jin Hyuk perseveres, vowing to endure and continue forward. Returning to the starting point, all damage reverts. While it's excruciating, Jin Hyuk decides to gauge his endurance, but he understands he can't recklessly charge ahead. Upon touching his spilled blood, he discusses the two traits that made him Earth's strongest climber. The first is gluttony, enabling him to assimilate non-living objects and make them his own. As he absorbs the blood, he explains that the lifeless blood's experiences become his own. With this, he gains a reward of plus one stat point on his tolerance exp. Content with the increased tolerance, he's confident he can manage basic status anomalies even without dealing with equipment settings. He anticipates a week to complete the tutorial and become a skilled climber, but he persists in enduring the arrow barrage. Utilizing this technique, he plans to raise his stats through gluttony until his tolerance exp maxes out. A month later, he stands next to the final portal, surrounded by arrows. The system congratulates him for successfully finishing the tutorial, prompting a sigh of relief from Jinyuk. He acknowledges the prolonged duration due to frequent back-and-forth traversal. Suddenly, another system emerges, informing him that both gods and demons are intrigued by his approach. Incensed, Jin Hyuk curses them as sadistic individuals. He elaborates that they monitor players to find someone akin to them. 
Recognizing that none of them reveal their true names, Jin Yuk suspects they employ tricks to gain disciples. The system relays that a demon appears to be smiling, and as the system shifts from blue to red, a message from Peak of All Evil greets Jin Hyuk, asking how he's been. Jin Hyuk, identifying the demon as Baal, calls him a persistent individual. He recounts that in his previous life, Baal relentlessly pursued him to become his disciple, and it was Baal who enabled him to obtain soul transmission. With both gods and demons interested in him, Jin Hyuk vents his anger at Baal for attracting their attention. As numerous entities express curiosity, Jin Hyuk demands they quiet down, labeling them all as vexing. He asserts that if they want to know whom he chooses, they should clandestinely observe and remain silent. He makes it clear that Baal isn't a candidate and instructs him to cease his aspirations. Jin Hyuk then examines his tutorial stage rewards, noting the acquisition of blood loss tolerance, pain tolerance, unconsciousness tolerance, penetration tolerance, and the ability to endure. His stats have also experienced a significant boost. Jin Hyuk gleefully explains that it's challenging to acquire mana at this stage, but his mana has increased due to his mana type nature. The system reveals that due to his growth, a new trait, all rounder, has been unlocked. Perplexed, Jin Hyuk wonders how he's receiving another trait when he already possesses gluttony. He concludes that the body's previous owner must have possessed this trait. The system elucidates that all rounder enables proficiency in various areas, providing adjustments during training and combat. This excites Jin Hyuk immensely, as it may facilitate his quest for the title of All Master. Just as he revels in the potential, Baal's curiosity about Jin Hyuk's status window jolts him into shock. Jin Hyuk's emotions shift, and he firmly tells Baal to cease his interference and leave him alone. He instructs Baal to proceed to the next floor and follow him if desired. As Jin Hyuk enters the portal to the next room, he's transported to the room of choice and training. The system extends a welcome, prompting him to select a weapon and class that best suits him. Once his choice is made, he's to destroy the floor beneath him, which will transport him to the tower's first floor. Jin Hyuk explains that in his previous life, after discovering he was a mana type, he promptly chose to become a mage. Generating a practice target, he employs his new trait, All Rounder, to gauge its effectiveness. As targets appear, Jin Hyuk expertly employs a bow, hitting the targets with precision. He asks the system to generate more targets, this time with the ability to attack him. The system cautions him about the danger since he hasn't selected a class yet. With a confident smile, Jin Hyuk dismisses the warning, stating he doesn't mind. As the targets assail him, he adeptly uses the bow and sword to eliminate them. Standing assertively with dual weapons, he urges the system to summon more targets. The difficulty escalates, producing larger targets. Without hesitation, Jin Hyuk leaps onto a giant target, impaling it with a spear. Armed with two knives, he hurls them at targets behind him. Ranged targets emerge, but Jin Hyuk takes cover behind the giant target, avoiding their shots. The system alerts him that these are the most hazardous targets for this floor. Undaunted, Jin Hyuk dashes towards a staff and uses magical arrows to destroy the drone targets. Impressed with the prowess of the all-rounder trait, he attests to feeling as though he's been wielding these weapons for years. The system announces that he's cleared a new achievement, the All-Master achievement, attained by utilizing at least one weapon from each category in the room of choice and training. He's rewarded with All Master unlocked attack stat plus 5,000. The system inquires whether he'd like to select All Master as his class, but it cautions that this choice can't be made once he exits the room of choice and training. Jin Hyuk contemplates his decision, realizing that even though the All Master class is enticing, he can't abandon his primary advantage. Consequently, he decides to ask the system to designate All Master as his subclass. Shock overtakes him as the system informs him it's impossible. He queries the system about the reason and it responds that subclass slots can only be unlocked after the 100th floor. He regrets forgetting about this aspect during the early stages of the game. Although it might be wasteful, he considers utilizing his accomplishment points to unlock the subclass slot. He poses the question to the system, inquiring if he can use his accomplishment points for this purpose. The system expresses surprise 
at how a novice is aware of such a mechanism. It elucidates that accomplishment points are a currency earned through completing tasks, enabling users to make changes to the system. Jin Hyuk asserts that there's no need to question how he's privy to this knowledge, speculating if he could utilize 5,000 points to unlock the subclass slot, he learns it's feasible, but he currently possesses only 5,000 points, while 5,050 are required. Annoyed, he states he'll employ Baal. Addressing the system, he calls out to peak of all evil, Baal, revealing his identity in the previous conversation they had. He informs the system that there's an accomplishment for initiating dialogue with the gods for the first time. This act awards him 200 accomplishment points. Peak of all evil asks if he has done well, but Jin Hyuk pleads with Baal to never do something similar again. The system queries whether he'd like to use his accomplishment points to select all master as his subclass. Jin Hyuk agrees, and the system extends congratulations, bestowing him with the all master subclass. The system informs him that destroying the room of choice and training floor will transport him to the tower's first floor. With excitement, Jin Hyuk concentrates energy in his staff, ready to commence his quest for revenge. He destroys the floor beneath him, initiating his journey. Meanwhile, on the first floor, known as Coral Forest, two climbers struggle to progress, questioning how they can conquer the tower if the initial floor poses such difficulty. A creature called a kobold charges towards one of the climbers. Suddenly, a rift in the sky opens and Jin Yuk emerges, identifying the kobold as his first prey. He lands on its head, swiftly slaying it. The witnessing kobold trembles in fear as Jin Yuk eyes the climbers menacingly, sticking out his tongue and suggesting he wonders what he'll gain by devouring them all. One of the adventurers is astounded by Jin Hyuk's remarkable feat in single-handedly vanquishing a kobold. Furthermore, the observer notices Jin Hyuk's mastery in the mage class. A climber approaches Jin Hyuk and suggests joining forces. Jin Hyuk responds with a menacing tone, instructing them to depart, which takes the climbers by surprise. Continuing his stance, Jin Hyuk warns them that any contact with the kobolds will lead to fatal consequences. Trembling in fear, the two climbers hastily flee for their lives. Subsequently, as two kobolds advance to attack Jin Hyuk, he employs his staff skillfully, delivering a lethal blow to one of them. With a menacing glare, he challenges the remaining kobold, questioning its intentions. The kobold, deciding to escape, is met with Jin Hyuk's relentless pursuit. A magical arrow unleashed by Jin Hyuk puts an end to the kobold's flight, extinguishing its life. The system materializes, extending a welcoming greeting to Jin Hyuk on the first floor. However, Jin Hyuk expresses his disappointment, informing the system that he is presently occupied with looting. The system then presents him with a quest involving the extermination of ten kobolds, a task that Jin Hyuk finds undemanding. Jin Hyuk elucidates that by defeating a particular type of monster repeatedly, one attains the prestigious title of a slayer. He reveals that his past self had diligently pursued these slayer achievements. Addressing his hunger, Jin Hyuk employs gluttony, siphoning the essence of life from the kobold. This grants him access to the creature's memories and strengths, while also enabling him to comprehend the language of the kobolds. Upon scrutinizing his statistics, Jin Hyuk is impressed by their advancement, equating them to those of a climber on the 10th floor. Delving into the memories of the kobold, he discovers the existence of the kobold lord. Filled with excitement, Jin Hyuk perceives the timing of this revelation as serendipitous. He explains that a lord monster heralds an impending wave of monsters. Jin Hyuk realizes he can achieve his slayer goal while simultaneously farming by defeating this lord. Recognizing the necessity of an army to face the wave, he reanimates the fallen kobolds, transforming them into skeleton soldiers. The system commends his successful class change to a necromancer, acknowledging his all-master status and past life memories that make class changing effortless. Yet, Jin Hyuk remains unsatisfied, knowing there is a concealed class he must attain on the first floor. Observing the trembling kobolds, a skeleton informs Jin Hyuk of their fear upon witnessing their king's transformation. Jin Hyuk orders the skeletons to eliminate any kobold they encounter. Carrying a blue stone and accompanied by his skeletal battalion, he arrives at a secluded location he sought, a small house nestled within the forest. 
Upon entering, he expresses gratitude for its undisturbed state. Asking the soldiers to wait outside, Jin Hyuk ventures deeper into the house, uncovering a hidden staircase beneath the floor. As he descends, he elucidates the presence of a significant class on the first floor, a necromancer, a high-ranking mage utilizing souls known as a spirit master. The first spirit master concealed within this place is Vulcan, a necromancer, indicated by the class-changing coffin. Upon opening the coffin, a skeletal figure emerges, suspended in the air. The skeleton inquires of Jin Hyuk if he is his descendant. Vulcan is taken aback by Jin Hyuk's nonchalant demeanor and inquires if Jin Hyuk isn't surprised to see him, considering Vulcan's attempt to appear spectacular. Jin Hyuk retorts that a necromancer shouldn't be astonished by the sight of a skeleton. He clarifies that he arrived here after perusing Vulcan's journal and is past the point of surprise. This journal, a concealed item titled Journal of Spirit Master Vulcan, was not read in this lifetime. But during the period when he lost his worth upon changing his class to a mage, he explains he came back to the first floor after discovering the journal, and upon becoming a spirit master, struggled unsuccessfully to summon Vulcan. Vulcan expresses his fondness for Jin Hyuk, noting his superiority compared to a discourteous individual from a decade earlier. Irritated by Vulcan's criticism of his past life, Jin Hyuk contemplates whether he should eliminate him. However, he decides to overlook it and focuses on completing his class change. Jin Hyuk informs Vulcan of his desire to change his class swiftly. Vulcan apologizes and explains that Jin Hyuk must first reach the 10th floor, as Spirit Master is a higher ranking class than even Necromancer. He reveals that Jin Hyuk needs to undergo a second class change in the class changing tower on the 10th floor before he can proceed. Jin Hyuk interjects, revealing his status as a necromancer through his stats. Vulcan is astounded by Jin Hyuk's self driven class change without ascending to the 10th floor. He acknowledges Jin Hyuk's prominence and skill, comparing him favorably to the punk from Jin Hyuk's past life. Annoyed, Jin Hyuk urges Vulcan to facilitate his class change. Vulcan chuckles and generates a surge of energy around them. Jin Hyuk then recounts the backstory of Vulcan, a climber of immense power who sought to surpass his abilities. Vulcan, dissatisfied with conventional summons, aspired to summon a soul, leading him to create the Spirit Masterclass. Unfortunately, his physical body and the Spirit Masterclass neared extinction, leading Vulcan to employ necromancy on himself with the hope that his descendant would restore his honor. Thus, Vulcan transformed into a half-NPC figure, serving as a guide for future climbers. Vulcan, impressed by Jin Hyuk's aura, provides instructions on using the Soul Crucible to capture souls and consequently summon entities. Jin Hyuk contemplates capturing Vulcan with the Soul Crucible, his preparations already complete. Vulcan commends Jin Hyuk as his descendant and urges him to ascend the tower and spread his name. With a sly smile, Jin Hyuk points to Vulcan telling him to undertake this task personally. Confused and disappointed, Vulcan questions Jin Hyuk's assertion. In an outburst, Vulcan refers to him as a bastard and inquiries about the promise written in the journal. Standing resolutely, Jin Hyuk asserts that shirking responsibilities onto others is a negative trait. He promises to resolve the matter for free, unsettling Vulcan. In a menacing manner, Jin Hyuk activates soul collection causing Vulcan's soul to be drawn from his skeletal form. Vulcan struggles and defiantly gestures, refusing to be captured. Jin Hyuk's satisfaction grows as a magic barrier encloses Vulcan, creating a personal prison. Jin Hyuk asks if Vulcan is comfortable and explains that this magic wall is a basic spell, a customized prison for Vulcan. As Vulcan protests, Jin Hyuk interrupts, revealing that he had previously scattered kobold mana stones on his journey here. He cast magic to activate them, just as he has done now. While Vulcan can easily break the low-level magic, he questions whether he can do so before Jin Hyuk captures him. Vulcan ponders who this man is, trapped in his grasp, marveling at the skill and tactics of a first-floor climber. Removing his hood, Jin Hyuk discloses his identity and asserts that although he failed in his past life, he can now capture Vulcan. With confidence, Jin Hyuk declares himself the second spirit master, perhaps even the third. Vulcan comprehends the dire situation, recognizing Jin Hyuk and shouting his name. Without hesitation, Jin Hyuk activates his skill soul collection, 
absorbing Vulcan's soul thoroughly. Left with an empty skeleton, Jin Hyuk assures Vulcan that everything he yearned for will come to fruition now that he is with him. Returning to the exterior of the house, Jin Hyuk gazes upon his skeletal warriors and declares his newfound redundancy for such companions. He proceeds to shatter the skeletal entities, awakening the ethereal essences of the kobolds he had vanquished. Despite a mild sense of disappointment stemming from their inability to communicate, his attention abruptly shifts to Vulcan, who now stands in his human guise. Incredulously, Vulcan questions Jin Hyuk's audacity in utilizing him as a spirit soldier. With an insidious grin, Jin Hyuk remarks that this marks his first encounter with Vulcan in this form, further noting Vulcan's probable handsomeness during his youth. Consumed by fury at Jin Hyuk's disrespect, Vulcan bellows vehemently, vowing not to let such affronts pass unchallenged. After all, he is the original spirit master. However, Vulcan's ire quickly subsides as an enigmatic force constricts his throat, compelling him to bow before Jin Hyuk. In a commanding tone, Jin Yuk cautions Vulcan against excessive resistance, elucidating that his very existence is sustained by Jin Yuk's mana. Severing this connection would precipitate Vulcan's immediate dissolution. With his head still bowed, Vulcan retorts, questioning Jin Yuk's presumption that he will be so easily dominated. Yet, Jin Yuk's voice drips with menace as he reminds Vulcan of the dire consequences of defiance, namely being transmuted into soul orbs and subsequently absorbed. He prompts Vulcan to recollect the trait that defines him, which Vulcan acknowledges as gluttony. This recollection evokes the memory of Jin Hyuk's insatiable skill, stoking Vulcan's realization that resistance would merely result in being devoured whole by Jin Hyuk's overwhelming power. Following a period of contemplation, Vulcan capitulates, conceding that he possesses no alternative but to acquiesce to Jin Hyuk's commands. With a sense of resignation, Vulcan inquires about Jin Yuk's intended course of action. Jin Yuk's outstretched finger points towards a distant castle, signaling their joint mission to topple the Kobold Lord. At the castle's entrance, two Kobolds strive to impede Jin Yuk's advance. However, Jin Yuk responds with a sinister smile, summoning his spiritual entities, which promptly dispatch the Kobold Sentinels. Inwardly, Jin Yuk acknowledges his augmentation a retinue of 30 kobold spirit soldiers now under his command. He notes with confidence that kobolds are no longer worthy adversaries. Determined not to remain passive in this existence, Jinyuk stands resolute, ordering the kobolds to present their master. Within the castle's confines, the kobold lord directs one of his kobold guards to prepare an offering. Simultaneously, beyond the castle walls, Jinyuk engages in a relentless campaign utterly annihilating every kobold he encounters. Empowered by his spirits, he stands virtually impervious to harm. As a smile graces Jin Hyuk's lips, he reminisces about his surroundings, realizing that he's drawing closer to the inner chamber of the kobold lord. Abruptly, a message from Baal appears, informing Jin Hyuk of the deity's support, symbolized by the display of luminous batons. Emitting an exasperated sigh, Jin Hyuk dismisses the encouragement, rejecting the notion of cheering from an elderly figure with her suit legs. He confidently asserts his impending victory regardless. Shifting back to the Kobold Lord's realm, a harrowing scene unfolds as the Lord repeatedly impales a hapless victim, demanding more with fervor. He vocalizes his dissatisfaction, insisting that the sacrifices must continue until the entity known as the Death-Observing Demon is appeased. In a sudden shift, Two goblins materialize, restraining a young woman adorned with horns. The goblin lord identifies her as a Dokibi, invoking the significance of these legendary beings from Korean mythology and folklore. The kobold lord seizes the Dokibi, asserting that she will serve as a far superior offering compared to mere humans. However, a luminous burst of light erupts, sundering the connection between the kobold lord and the Dokibi. This unexpected turn draws the Kobold Lord's attention, causing his gaze to lock onto Jin Hyuk, whom he labels an intruder. Unfazed, Jin Hyuk's smile takes on an ominous quality as he jests. What do we have here? A human sacrifice, a summoning. Yet Jin Hyuk quickly dismisses the significance of these events in relation to his central goal, recognizing that all those present are destined to meet their demise. Jin Hyuk gazes upon the Kobold Lord, 
and remarks that it bears an uncanny resemblance to the wretched scum leader he truly is. Enraged by Jin Hyuk's comment, the Kobold Lord demands that Jin Hyuk display some respect. However, Jin Hyuk sharply counters that the Lord's arrogance far outweighs its status as a mere first floor monster. The Dokaibi, though unsure of the situation, recognizes that the Kobold Lord is preoccupied by Jin Hyuk's presence, granting her the opportunity to flee. Spotting her escape, the Kobold Lord bellows in anger, questioning how she dares to run. Seeking strength from the death-observing demon, the Kobold Lord captures Jin Yuk's attention. The Kobold then unleashes a devastating attack known as the Corpse Spear, aimed directly at the Dokebi. As she stumbles and falls, her inner thoughts echo her reluctance to meet her end here. In an unexpected turn, Jin Yuk materializes to shield her from the assault, effortlessly thwarting the strike. The Kobold Lord is left utterly stunned, bewildered by Jin Hyuk's ability to effortlessly deflect the onslaught. Grateful, the Dokebi expresses her thanks, but Jin Hyuk sternly instructs her to vacate the area. A closer inspection reveals her to be a Dokebi, a powerful species residing on the hundredth floor, and Jin Hyuk asserts that they shouldn't concern themselves with matters beneath that level, particularly an individual who has yet to reach adulthood. Curious about the girl's situation, Jin Hyuk decides to save her, anticipating the acquisition of valuable information. The Kobold Lord protests Jin Hyuk's interference with its offering, prompting Jin Hyuk to warn her to find a hiding spot as he won't rescue her a second time. Undeterred, the Kobold Lord readies a menacing attack, preparing to unleash two explosive Kobolds. However, Jin Hyuk remains unfazed, taunting that it's too slow before delivering a forceful blow that propels the Kobold Lord into the air. The Kobold's astonishment deepens, grappling with the incongruity of a first-floor climber possessing such formidable strength. As Jin Yuk springs into the air, poised to deliver a powerful punch to the Kobold Lord, the latter beseeches the death-observing demon for salvation. In response, the blood amassed by the Kobold Lord over decades coalesces into a blood golem, which seizes Jin Yuk. Perplexed, Jin Yuk ponders how the Kobold Lord managed to summon such a potent familiar. The golem hurls Jin Hyuk to the ground with considerable force, evoking triumphant laughter from the Kobold Lord, who dubs this formidable spectacle his seance. Jin Hyuk, in a menacing tone, repeats the term seance, before demanding whether the Kobold Lord comprehends the individual he's addressing. With determination, Jin Hyuk summons his spirits, vowing to obliterate the blood golem and demonstrate the true power of a seance. The Kobold Lord is left dumbfounded by the swiftness with which Jin Hyuk dismantles the golem. Fixing the Kobold Lord with an intense gaze, Jin Hyuk highlights that blood golems are not within a Kobold's purview to create, even if it's a Lord monster. He inquires whether the death-observing demon Bune played a part in this, to which the demon confirms. Jin Hyuk recalls that Bune, intrigued by his abilities as a spirit master, summoned the blood golem upon witnessing his confrontation with one of its followers. Jin Hyuk dismisses the golem as a mere plaything, noting that Bune forcibly depleted the Kobold Lord's mana through its summoning. Fearing retribution even in death, the Kobold Lord wails that Bune will avenge him. Jin Hyuk dryly retorts that the Kobold should ensure that Bune follows through, given the weight of his actions. As the spirit Kobold sees the Kobold Lord, it defiantly proclaims its kingship imploring them to remember. Jin Yuk icily informs Bune that this marks the end of its little experiment, emphasizing that it's at fault for testing him. With a gaze oozing menace, Jin Hyuk declares that in addition, Bune will pay for attempting to challenge him. Death-observing demon Bune responds with hearty laughter, expressing its admiration. As Jin Hyuk clenches his fist, a splatter of blood paints the scene and a demonic incarnation of Jin Hyuk emerges within the pool of Kobold blood on the floor. As the essence of the Kobold Lord tries to escape, Jin Hyuk seizes it and transforms it into a soul orb. This act, soul orb production, is a fundamental skill of a necromancer, enabling the user to gather valuable components. Jin Hyuk opens his mouth and consumes the substantial spirit ball, pausing briefly. He contemplates that it didn't live up to his expectations though it won't matter once he reaches the 50th floor. His thoughts are interrupted by a young woman who expresses gratitude for her rescue. Identifying herself as Haryu, 
She extends her thanks, and Jin Hyuk reassures her, explaining his presence was due to dealing with the Kobold Lord. However, Haryu remains insistent on thanking him for saving her life. Out of the blue, Jin Hyuk questions what she would have done if he were a malevolent individual, capable of harming her and exploiting her like a dokebi. Haryu's tone takes on a menacing edge as she asserts that she would handle such a situation. Jin Hyuk ponders that when it comes to repaying favors and seeking revenge, they are vigilant about settling their debts. With a chuckle, Jin Hyuk likens her response to that of a dokebi. He inquires about her presence on a lower floor, despite seemingly belonging on the 100th floor. Haryu discloses that a group attacked the Dokebi village on the 100th floor, leaving Jin Hyuk taken aback. Jin Hyuk reflects that Dokebis are a robust species within the tower, posing a challenge even for climbers. He wonders if the assailants were part of the four great species, the Colossus of Strength Giants, the Essence of Magic, Dragons, the Masters of Demonic Energy, Demons, and the Wings of Retribution, Angels. These four dominate the tower's hierarchy. Jin Hyuk speculates that the attackers would have had to possess some connection to these species or their guilds. Deciding to depart, Jin Hyuk asks Haryu if she intends to remain amid pools of blood. She expresses her desire to accompany him, and he contemplates that despite her youth, she could be a valuable addition to his group. He informs her of his impending busy schedule and inability to provide constant protection. She asserts her ability to fend for herself. Jin Hyuk remarks that she narrowly escaped death from the Kobold Lord, but she playfully retorts that her lapse in vigilance caused that. Surveying his blood-stained attire, Jin Hyuk privately acknowledges the need for new clothing. His gaze shifts to the Kobold Lord, catching sight of an equipment item. Stepping out of the castle in his fresh new drip, a portal emerges, heralding Vulcan's arrival to confirm the extermination of all living kobolds within the castle. Haryu inquires about the identity of the old man, prompting Vulcan's astonishment at her ability to see him. Haryu explains that a select few Dokebi possess a strong affinity with souls. With a knowing smile, Jin Hyuk concludes that Haryu is a unique Dokebi. He briefly entertains the thought of using gluttony to absorb her ability but decides against it, choosing instead to keep her close and train her. Bro is investing, respectable. A system notification materializes, presenting Jin Yuk with the Monster Wave quest. An invitation to defeat a Lord Monster that could trigger a Monster Wave. Both Vulcan and Haryu advise him against accepting it. Yet Jin Yuk reasons that he wouldn't have embarked on this journey if he didn't intend to accept challenges. Despite criticism from others, Jin Yuk's decision prompts concern from a deity called Peak of All Evil, and a death-observing demon offers a reward for ranking first in contribution. With a confident grin, Jin Hyuk resolves to decide after seeing the reward. Vulcan expresses disbelief, questioning if Jin Hyuk truly wishes to tempt fate. Jin Hyuk acknowledges that Vulcan might wish for his death for the sake of freedom, but he changes his stance, asserting that Vulcan will remain his servant even beyond death. Confirming his choice with a press of a button, the system broadcasts a notice of a looming monster wave. In Coral Village's first floor safety zone, villagers ponder the identity of the person who accepted the perilous quest. A climber advises those who completed the quest to hasten to the second floor before the wave's onslaught, emphasizing that once it begins, escape becomes impossible. A brilliant light bathes the forest, releasing countless kobolds, evoking screams of terror from the assembled climbers who fear their impending demise. Yet a sudden burst of light reveals only Jin Hyuk and his companions emerging unscathed. Jin Hyuk asserts that if anyone dares to touch even a single kobold, he will swiftly unleash a wave of destruction upon all of them. The climbers find themselves pondering over the identities of the main character and his companions, who caution them about the perilous situation. However, Jin Hyuk astonishes everyone by summoning his spirit soldiers leaving them in awe as they wonder how he acquired such a class on the first floor. Amidst the chaos, Haryu asks Jin Hyuk if she too can attempt to achieve the Slayer title. Jin Hyuk advises her to act swiftly, as he doubts the spirit soldiers will leave her any opportunity. Calming her concerns, Haryu shares her plan, invoking a skill called a pocket plane. To Jin Hyuk's surprise, 
She extracts a sword from this plane and deftly eliminates a kobold. Jin Hyuk privately acknowledges the extraordinary nature of the sword and its wielder, a young Dokkaebi who wields it with mastery. A realization dawns on Jin Hyuk, causing him to speculate whether the invader's target is Haryu. Amidst this turmoil, a climber named Kim Seung Tai confronts Jin Hyuk, questioning his authority over the wave. In response, Jin Hyuk calmly inquires about Kim's identity, prompting Kim to proudly introduce himself as a member of the White Swallow Guild, a subsidiary of the renowned Nine Star Pelon Siblings Holy Land Guild. Tension rises as Jin Hyuk's anger surfaces upon mention of the Pelon Siblings. Kim further boasts that he and his brother plan to join the guild upon reaching the tenth floor. Kim's observation of Jin Hyuk's remarkable skills leads to an offer to help him join the guild through his brother. In a timely manner, a spirit seizes Kim, providing Jin Hyuk with a moment to extract information from him. Jin Hyuk issues a veiled threat, implying that they'll meet again after the wave, for Jin Hyuk has questions demanding answers. However, other climbers chastise Jin Hyuk, disapproving of his intimidation tactics. Jin Hyuk dismissively explains that within the tower, strength prevails, unlike on Earth where societal norms restrain certain actions. As Jin Hyuk releases Kim, he cautions him to heed his words, using his need for information as his sole reason for sparing him. He urges the climbers to distance themselves from him, rather than provoke him further. The climbers, concerned about their friend, discuss their course of action. In a surprising twist, Kim advises them to flee, fearing the consequences of encountering Jin Hyuk once more. On the battlefield, Jin Hyuk and Vulcan adopt a menacing demeanor as they execute a powerful attack from the sky, overwhelming the kobolds. As they land, they summon their soldiers, further turning the tide against the kobold forces. Jin Hyuk instructs Vulcan to transform the fallen into skeletons, a request Vulcan dismisses, stating it's unnecessary to remind him. With a resolute stride, Jin Hyuk engages the kobolds in combat, dispatching them swiftly and gracefully. Meanwhile, Haryu, fatigued, falls victim to a kobold ambush, resulting in a severe injury. With unwavering determination, Haryu reflects on her current wound, comparing it to the anguish she endured when her village was engulfed in flames. In her eyes, this injury pales in comparison. She engages in battle with an unwavering resolve, pressing on until she reaches her physical limits. Amidst the combat, her attention shifts towards Jin Yuk, prompting her to wonder how a mere first-floor climber, a human, could possess such extraordinary strength. She resolves to follow in Jin Hyuk's footsteps and ascend the tower, envisioning her vengeance upon those responsible for her village's destruction. As a kobold nears her, Vulcan intervenes, preventing the attack and inquiring about her well-being. Struggling to rise, Haryu's determination leaves an impression on Vulcan, who ponders the hardship she must have faced. Haryu questions why he aided her, perplexing Vulcan. She recounts that when she fled from the 100th floor, no one offered assistance. She expresses gratitude for encountering kindness rather than hostility. With a pointed look, she probes Vulcan about their motives for helping her. Vulcan responds that spirit soldiers must obey their spirit master's commands, and that Jin Hyuk instructed him to ensure Haryu's survival and the completion of her objective. He informs her of his departure, motivated by the desire to evade Jin Hyuk's potential reprimands for not working diligently enough. Haryu reflects inwardly, recognizing Jin Hyuk as the sole individual who offered her assistance within the tower. She's determined to repay his kindness. Masked, she transforms into an entirely different persona, swiftly dispatching numerous kobolds with astonishing speed. Meanwhile, Jin Hyuk's intuition proves correct. The assailants who targeted Haryu's village were after her and the distinctive sword she wields. Jin Hyuk deems it prudent to keep this knowledge hidden, understanding the potential impact on Haryu if she were to discover her connection to the tragedy. As the final minute of the wave ticks away, the trio of heroes valiantly battles the remaining kobolds. Realizing the last enemy standing, Jin Hyuk expertly throws his knife, ending the threat and concluding the wave. The system extends congratulations for Jin Yuk's effective wave-stopping efforts. With the ordeal finally concluded, Haryu succumbs to exhaustion, but Jin Hyuk's swift intervention prevents her fall. 
He inquires about her well-being and cautions against using her skill when fatigued. Haryu blushes and expresses her gratitude towards Jin Hyuk. In a system interface that materializes before them, it's announced that rewards will be distributed for contributions in the first, second and third positions. Jin Hyuk's excitement mounts as he anticipates receiving his well-deserved compensation. Our protagonist attained an achievement that granted a plus five bonus to all attributes, along with 500 achievement points. Gazing upon the augmentation, he comprehended that while it represented a minor advancement, the achievement points carried a more profound significance for him. Through these points, he could access a diverse array of abilities and potentially perpetually enhance his attributes. The initial recipient of the achievement was Jin Hyuk, followed by Haryu, and then Vulcan. Vulcan found himself puzzled by receiving an award, but Jin Hyuk conjectured that Vulcan's expertise warranted it. Despite this, our hero held the belief that Vulcan ought to grant him the award. Similarly, Haryu wished to bestow her reward upon our hero, symbolizing hope for their shared future. Following contemplation, our hero hesitated, his past betrayals prompting distrust. He was wary of being manipulated by the girl, and reluctant to accept what appeared to be a substantial inducement for second place. He desired the girl to earn his trust, or else he would reconsider her companionship. In that very moment, the girl conjured a portal, extracting her mask and donning it along with her received rewards. Vulcan was taken aback, as the girl intended to relinquish the mask. Our hero understood the mask as a representation of their life essence, not something to be given to strangers. Puzzled by the girl's gesture, he learned it was a token of gratitude for saving her life twice, evidence of her trust. He sensed a deeper meaning behind the mask. Suddenly, the girl faded away, revealing her underlying motive, revenge. She recounted the destruction of her village, her status as the sole survivor fueling her quest for vengeance. Overwhelmed by emotion, she extended her reward to our hero, entreating him to join her in the tower. Touched by her plea, our hero accepted the reward, yet cautioned her against dire consequences should she betray him. Tears of joy streamed down the girl's face, as she eagerly anticipated their continued journey together. Our hero dismissed his rewards, understanding that names held little significance. As he did so, a mana ring, necklace and earrings manifested. Vulcan approved of the items, deeming them perfect for a necromancer reliant on mana to support their forces. These items would augment our hero's creatures by 45%. They unanimously agreed to set course for Bune, prompting our hero to question the promise made to him upon arrival. Discovering the city empty, Jin Hyuk speculated that its inhabitants likely sought refuge on the second floor or within the woods to evade the approaching wave. Our hero pursued the conversation, inquiring about the demon's commitment and the quality of the anticipated item. The demon requested patience, yet at that moment, a ring materialized on the table, emitting a palpable demonic energy. Our hero was incredulous, for this energy's presence implied attraction to demons. Although the ring granted access to demonic energy, its possession of the highest quality mana seemed unbelievable. Such power usually demanded submission to demons, rendering this revelation extraordinary. Prepared to extend a handshake, the demon's offer was accepted by our hero, recognizing the value of the item. Vulcan advocated focusing on ascending the tower, while Baal seethed with jealousy, also requesting a handshake. Jin Hyuk declined unless a gift was proffered, and Vulcan sought items from the demon as well. Hence, Baal formulated a quest or task for Jin Hyuk. Realizing the opportunity, Jin Hyuk understood the mutual benefit of their arrangement. Our protagonist agreed to undertake the task bestowed upon them by Baal, though Baal started to show signs of uncertainty. Our hero proposed that if Baal was unwilling to act, then they should abstain from action. However, it was clear to all that this decision came too late, due to the already established agreement. At that instance, a notification materialized before our hero, outlining the conditions of the pact. The mission designated by Baal was for our hero to establish a reputation before reaching the 100th floor. Failing to do so would entail our hero becoming Baal's apostle, effectively his disciple. In the event of success, Baal pledged to provide a blueprint for any creation. The sole stipulation of the contract was a handshake with Baal. 
Our hero found it difficult to believe their ears. The prospect of gaining a blueprint for anything left them exhilarated. Nevertheless, becoming Baal's apprentice was something they ardently wished to avoid. In spite of this, they resolved to seize the opportunity and shook hands with Baal. Exiting the establishment, they pondered their next steps. Their objective was to locate Kim and extract pertinent information from him. Jin Hyok instructed Vulcan to track him down. Vulcan inquired whether Jin Hyok had Kim's whereabouts, to which Jin Hyok disclosed that he had stationed a spiritual soldier on Kim. Despite Kim being distant, he remained on the first floor. Just before entering the portal, Vulcan reproached Jin Hyuk for not informing him earlier, prompting Vulcan to respond that he would make his way there. Jin Hyuk suggested to Haryu that they converse while walking, revealing a mask and urging Haryu to provide further insights about it. Strolling through the forest, Haryu succinctly explained that the mask granted its wearer the ability to employ their Dokebi capabilities. Jin Hyuk inquired about the connection of Dokebi abilities to charms and supernatural powers, an assertion Haryu affirmed. Haryu articulated that she could use her supernatural abilities and employ the foresight skill to glimpse into the future. Jin Hyuk contemplated the concept of foresight, finding it somewhat regrettable as he would have preferred an ability useful in combat. Abruptly, Haryu fixed her gaze on him, leading Jin Hyuk to question the reason. Haryu brushed it off as nothing and remarked that she found Jin Hyuk to be rather peculiar. She recounted how outsiders would travel for days to consult the village elders, who possessed the ability to glimpse into the future. Most sought these seers out of concern for their impending fate, striving to avert it through any means possible. Jin Hyuk questioned the necessity of avoiding it, suggesting that if there was a source of apprehension, he could simply overcome it. Haryu responded, expressing her relief and stating that her abilities would be well suited to Jin Hyuk, despite his ongoing confusion. Haryu elaborated that her ability was battle foresight, tailored for combat. She asked if her skill was beneficial, and unexpectedly, Jin Hyuk embraced her, praising her ability's excellence. Blushing profusely, Haryu found herself caught off guard. While still holding her, Jin Hyuk conveyed his satisfaction that she possessed this ability deeming her the best. He privately mused about the various combat specialized nine stars, speculating his chances in a confrontation. Meanwhile, Haryu struggled to catch her breath and maintain her composure. The divine and demonic entities observed the unfolding situation with great intrigue. Our hero chided Baal for their persistent presence, yet Baal expressed delight in assisting and pledged aid in Haryu's quest for vengeance. Jin Hyuk extended his apologies to Haryu for the spontaneous hug, with Haryu assuring him it was inconsequential and she was content to offer assistance. Jin Hyuk pledged to make the most of the mask's potential and support her in her quest for revenge. Grateful, Haryu wished them both a promising future. Vulcan, in the meantime, had apprehended Kim and recommended awaiting his master's arrival. He inquired about our hero's whereabouts and the challenges of detaining someone without causing harm. Our hero requested Vulcan's clearance to approach Kim, driving his sword into a nearby tree. Jin Yuk informed Kim that he intended to return his sword, considering where to strike next depending on Kim's response and his own inclination. Kim consented to divulge all he knew, including insights into the guilds. After amassing the necessary information, our hero allowed Kim to depart. Thoughts arose about forming an alliance with the Sacred State and guilds from the 10th to the 200th levels, recognizing the advantages of cooperation in their effort to overcome them. Haryu broached the topic of Baal's task, and our hero concurred, suggesting that dismantling the guilds under the twins' influence would provide an opportunity to fulfill the demon's directive. They resolved to proceed to the tenth floor. The setting shifted to the safe zone on the second floor, where discussions swirled about our protagonist's triumph over the wave. As they traversed a portal, the sight of Jin Hyuk's ghost mask prompted unease and recognition among the bystanders. Following his triumph over the wave, individuals inquired about his guild and identity. Recalling Baal's instructions, Jin Hyuk decided it wasn't the right moment to unveil his true name. Thus, he introduced himself with an air of menace as Ghostface. People assumed that Joseph had a shady past before he arrived at the tower. 
given the common practice of people seeking refuge inside its walls. Joseph felt relieved that things were unfolding as he'd planned, because concealing one's identity within the tower was par for the course. He was confident that his news about the wave and the mysterious mask had piqued people's curiosity. Without revealing more, Joseph and his team teleported away. In a lush forest, they were greeted by the system, ushering them to the tower's second floor. The quest was straightforward. Defeat ten cobbles and ten cobbled warriors each to proceed. Joseph, being the laid-back person he was, promptly assigned the task to Vulcan. Vulcan, struggling to contain his irritation, asked, Do you want me to bring them back alive to you? Joseph, unfazed, replied affirmatively, adding, And you can bring Haryu with you if you want. I'm going to experiment with demonic energy. Return quickly if you want to witness it. Vulcan soared into the sky, advising Joseph not to deplete all the demonic energy before his return. Innocently, Haryu questioned the ethics of completing the quest this way, to which Joseph retorted, If you don't like it, feel free to do it yourself. I'm not forcing anyone. Summoning his demonic energy with a twist of his rings, Joseph declared, Let's see how this works. He gathered a fiery swirl of demonic energy. Suddenly, Haru alerted Joseph to a lurking cobbled. Joseph attempted to strike the monster with a skill called Demonic Exposure, but the creature narrowly evaded the attack, sustaining only a minor graze. Haru pointed out the monster's evasion, but Joseph explained, It's an attack that doesn't need to hit. Strangely, the cobbled began to crumble as if made of stone. Surprised, Haru asked what happened, and Joseph explained that demonic energy was a brutal force, unfit for the uninitiated. Joseph then captured the spirit of Kabul to commence his experiment. He hoped that infusing demonic energy into a spirit soldier would create a stronger one, but the soul started to disintegrate under the strain. Joseph quickly reduced the demonic energy to a manageable level, successfully creating a new spirit soldier with a touch of demonic energy. Haryu praised his accomplishment, but Joseph expressed his surprise at how easy it was for him, given that not many could handle pure demonic energy like demons. Vulcan returned with the captured monsters and marveled at the newly created spirit. He called it a demon soul soldier. Vulcan inspected it closely, stating, This soldier is perfectly fused, and Vulcan commended his student. Contemplating the difficulty of infusing souls with demonic energy on the field, Joseph decided to entrust summoning to Vulcan, acknowledging his proficiency in the task. Vulcan blushed at the praise, remarking that Joseph finally respected him. Jinyuk suddenly imbued demonic energy all over Vulcan, causing him intense pain. Vulcan questioned Joseph's intentions, and Joseph revealed his plan. If I infuse demonic energy into Vulcan's soul, the spirit soldiers he summons will become demon soldiers automatically. He proceeded to use all his demonic energy, enveloping Vulcan in a massive amount. Haru worriedly asked about Vulcan's safety, but Joseph assured her, the first spirit master won't die from something like this. Vulcan, now transformed into a demon soul soldier, warned Joseph, you made a mistake, Joseph. Creating a summon stronger than yourself is your biggest blunder as a necromancer. Joseph donned the mask and confidently replied, I needed a worthy opponent with the mask on anyway. Vulcan conjures a multitude of new demon soul warriors. Jin Hyok triggers the mask's power, sensing a deceleration in the soldiers. However, he soon realizes the alteration in his perception of time, reminiscent of Haru's everyday experience. Swiftly, Jin Hyuk eradicates the monsters, dealing a forceful blow to Vulcan's visage. Vulcan crumples, producing a resounding impact. Concern gnaws at Haru, yet Jin Hyuk consoles her, stating, Fear not, physical assaults won't extinguish souls like that. Haru then inquires whether Jin Hyuk harnessed the mask's power. Confirming, he relates, It felt as if everything moved at a pace slower than mine. It was like I became briefly the supreme martial artist. Haru attributes this occurrence as an unintended consequence of the skill's malfunction. Jin Hyuk's confusion prompts him to query, if this was an unintended effect, what's the actual purpose of the mask? 
Haru clarifies. I mentioned it grants battle foresight, correct? Not only should the foe's movements decelerate, but you should also anticipate their forthcoming actions. Jin Yuk seizes her shoulders, inquiring, How can I attain such mastery? She humbly confesses, It emerged instinctively for me. Jin Yuk ponders her prodigious ability, even among the Dokaibis. Haru assesses his well-being, wondering if he experiences dizziness, to which Jin Hyuk responds that he is fine. She mentions that untrained individuals often undergo symptoms like headaches and vertigo when attempting special abilities. Haru admits this pertains to her as well, stating, Foresight eludes my control. I fretted since you initially couldn't activate the skill. Jin Hyuk jests, You possess a knack for pinpointing vulnerabilities. Haru playfully retorts, not quite my intention. I'm sure you'll soon master it. Following this setback, Jin Hyuk acknowledges his excessive excitement about being unbelievably strong on the second floor. Conversely, Vulcan wallows in despondency due to his failure, ruminating, I am the paramount spirit master. How have I plummeted thus? Haru approaches Vulcan, and misunderstanding her intent, he embraces her, shedding tears, asserting that she arrived to lift his spirits, unlike Jin Hyuk. Haryu clarifies her intention. They need him to summon spirit soldiers from the cobble creatures for a quest completion. Thus, they rapidly conquer both the third and fourth floors. Yet on the fifth floor, rumors swirl regarding a person self-dubbed Ghostface, who supposedly cleared the fourth floor and ventured into the fifth floor's forest within a mere three days. One individual remarks, Don't fret, he can only handle cobble creatures. From the fifth floor onward, Venomous goblins armed with potent poison needles emerge. Now Jin Hyuk is occupied with an activity involving his mama on the ground. Unbeknownst, a goblin hides on a tree, launching a poison needle at Jin Hyuk. Haru intervenes, severing the needle before impact. A wicked grin plays upon her lips as she jeers, You dare assault Jin Hyuk? In response, Vulcan dispatches a spirit soldier to vanquish the goblin. Vulcan commends Haru's swift action in neutralizing the poison needle. Yet his astonishment surges upon observing her sinister expression, wielding her sword. Vulcan subsequently inquires about her well-being, and she regains her composure. She herself is taken aback by her own amusement while clutching her sword. Following this, Jin Hyuk rises and declares, My preparations are complete, and tonight a formidable wave of monsters shall descend. It's worth noting that previously, just before entering the fifth floor, Jin Hyuk informed his team that the upcoming floor would be populated by goblins instead of cobbles, and their aim was to earn the title of Goblin Slayer. Haru raises a question regarding the necessity of hunting the Lord Monster once again. Vulcan informs him that such a hunt cannot be undertaken at will. The appearance of the monster is unpredictable, and its location on the tower remains uncertain. Jin Hyuk clarifies that he has no intention of pursuing the Goblin Lord, since he possesses the knowledge to manually initiate a wave. Both of them are taken aback upon learning that Joseph has the ability to manually trigger a wave. Vulcan points out that if such a method existed, rumors would surely have circulated throughout the tower. Jin Hyuk explains that he stumbled upon this information purely by chance. Recounting the event, he says, During one of my hunts near the periphery of the 400th floor, a crevice materialized as I scaled the tower. It was then that I made the discovery. He further elaborates that each floor houses a central zone that spawns monsters. By directing one's mana into this area, it engenders creatures akin to those in a monster wave. Vulcan acknowledges, you must have reaped significant benefits from this revelation. Jin Hyuk admits that he has only utilized this technique once as the monsters encountered on the 300th floor and above differ significantly from goblins in scale. He even states, even facing the four great species head-on during a wave would prove insurmountable. Vulcan remarks, when this exploit was viable, you were unaware of its existence and couldn't capitalize on it. Jin Hyuk concurs, saying, the circumstances have changed. Now we intend to provoke numerous waves to expedite our growth. Returning to the present, players on the fifth floor perceive seismic tremors. A massive portal materializes, akin to events on the second floor, and a horde of goblins pours forth. Unable to contend with their overwhelming numbers, the players flee, grappling with their helplessness. Suddenly, Jin Hyuk emerges, advising, 
the uninjured individual should escort the wounded to safety. The sight of the ghost face visage elicits joy as he has triumphed over a wave before. Jinyuk engineered this dramatic entrance to propagate rumors about his prowess. He then summons his new demon spirit soldiers to assail the enemy. Mid-battle, Jinyuk discerns that his demon soul soldiers are ablaze, their tormentors being the psychic goblins. To Vulcan, Jinyuk emphasizes the need to eliminate these psychic goblins before the raid can be successful. Haryu intervenes, decimating the monsters on the opposite side. Jin Yuk employs his Glutani skill to absorb the remains of a deceased psychic goblin, absorbing its fiery ability that influences even souls. With his soul fire skill, he swiftly eradicates the goblins in his vicinity. Suddenly, Haryu's sword radiates immense energy, conjuring a set of equipment upon her person. Without warning, she launches an attack on Jin Yuk with her blade. With a single swift stroke of her sword, Haruyu cleaved through nearly half the city, leaving goblins who witnessed it utterly astounded by such immense power. Meanwhile, Jinyuk stood there in sheer amazement as Haruyu obliterated the entire village in an instant. Upon closer inspection, he seemed to recognize the sword in her hands. A malevolent chuckle escaped her lips as she swung her blade toward Jinyuk, who narrowly dodged the sheer force obliterating the building behind him. Removing his mask, Jin Hyuk revealed himself and asked her if she recognized him, though she continued her relentless assault. Jin Hyuk managed to block her strikes, but couldn't help but acknowledge her overwhelming strength. With a mighty blow, Haruyu sent Jin Hyuk hurtling through the ruins, causing Vulcan to worry and call out their names telepathically. Vulcan inquired about their well-being, and Jin Hyuk reassured him, explaining that it felt like they were facing the Dokibis' final vanguard. With the monsters already dealt with, Jin Hyuk instructed Vulcan to handle the rest. Readjusting his mask, he knew his priority was dealing with Haruyu. In a daring leap towards Haruyu, Jin Hyuk employed his battle foresight skill, sensing the impending danger from her sword. He understood that failing to act would mean being cut to pieces. As he prepared to swing his axe at her, he reminded himself that there were no allies or enemies within the tower, despite her tragic story. This was the end. However, a moment of hesitation washed over him as he recalled her joyful demeanor. That momentary pause allowed Haruyu to seize his axe and use her own battle foresight. Her grin and menacing stare promising destruction she slashed Jin Hyuk, sending him reeling and injuring him. In a desperate move, Jin Hyuk summoned his skeletons, reanimating the goblins who had perished. He directed them to confront Haru Yu. Astonishingly, she effortlessly sliced the skeleton soldiers into pieces. Jin Hyuk, bewildered by her speed, wondered if she had used her battle foresight. He couldn't help but acknowledge that she was overwhelmingly powerful, leaving him questioning how he could possibly defeat her. Then, a massive explosion occurred, propelling Jin Hyuk backward. As he distanced himself from her, he sensed that something was amiss. He wondered if she was exhausted or experiencing some kind of side effect. Noticing her bleeding eyes, he realized something was wrong. He considered whether this was the rebound Haruyu had mentioned. If that were the case, he saw a glimmer of hope but he needed to ensure she couldn't use her battle foresight anymore. Jin Yuk sprinted and she pursued him. He leapt into a house through a window, causing Haruyu to momentarily pause. Jin Yuk taunted her, asking if she was coming for him. She menacingly leaped inside the window, preparing to attack. However, Jin Yuk suddenly reanimated two goblin zombies armed with paralytic poison darts confidently stating that even a Dokaibi would be affected by the dart with a direct hit. As the darts closed in, Jin Hyuk doubted that Haruyu could evade them without her battle foresight, so she made the choice to employ her unique ability and skillfully deflected the incoming darts and the zombie soldiers, much to Jin Hyuk's dismay. Subsequently, she lunged at Jin Hyuk, attempting a decisive slash, but Jin Hyuk narrowly evaded her relentless attacks. Undeterred, she fixed her intense gaze on Jin Hyuk and let out an eerie laugh, 
poised to impale him with her sword. However, in a surprising turn of events, a dart found its mark in Jin Hyuk, piercing through him and striking Haryu. Jin Hyuk admitted that without the rebound effect from using Battle Foresight, his seemingly implausible plan would have surely failed. His ingenious scheme involved shooting her with a poisoned dart from her blind spot, and it proved successful. Despite her fury, she collapsed, and Jin Hyuk just managed to catch her before she hit the ground. However, an unusual sensation lingered in his hands, making him wonder if it was a result of the paralytic poison from the dart. Jin Yuk decided to instruct one of his goblin zombies to fetch him a dart, which he promptly absorbed. In that moment, Jin Yuk gained newfound resistance to the effects of the dart, developing a paralytic ability. Observing Haryu, Jin Yuk remarked that she possessed quite the vexing power. Meanwhile, Haryu found herself in a serene, ethereal realm, floating amidst a beautiful pink landscape with her sword before her. Confused and disoriented, she couldn't place her whereabouts. Suddenly a man approached and inquired if she was the new wielder of the Dragon Slayer sword. He scrutinized her and noticed her youth, prompting Haryu to inquire if he was a Dokaebi. The man responded cryptically that she was both right and wrong. Perplexed, Haryu pressed him for an explanation, but he swiftly held his sword to her throat as a warning. He cautioned her that next time, if she drew the sword without proper preparation, it would consume her. In an instant, she awoke, her senses returning, finding herself being carried by Jin Hyuk. Baffled by their location, she questioned Jin Hyuk's actions, blushing slightly. He reassured her that he would explain everything later. As she rested on the bed, Jin Hyuk outlined their plan to replenish their resources and proceed to the tenth floor. He explained that every 10th floor within the tower held a significant city and a boss monster they needed to defeat to progress. Haryu mentioned her knowledge of the formidable orc warrior Vulcan, which Jin Hyuk affirmed was akin to a lord level monster. However, when Haryu suggested they would all go once they were healed, Jin Hyuk abruptly halted her with a firm no. He clarified that from now on, she would operate independently from the group. Shocked, Haryu questioned his intentions, fearing abandonment. Jin Hyuk reassured her that he wasn't abandoning her, and reminded her of the events on the fifth floor. Her memories ceased at a certain point, and Jin Hyuk informed her that her sword was a demon blade, possessing a skill comparable to an ego sword. It granted incredible power, but eroded one's sanity in return. Seated on the bed, he emphasized that relying on such an unstable power would lead to her breakdown before reaching the 100th floor. He assigned her a task, encouraging her to develop her own strength independently of the sword and ascend to the 10th floor on her own. It was her homework. She understood Jin Yuk's intentions to help her grow stronger. With a cheerful expression, she accepted the challenge, promising to become a worthy ally for Jin Yuk. Jin Yuk smirked and said, all right. The next morning, Jin Yuk, Vulcan, and Haryu stood on the street. Haryu expressed her gratitude for the rope and her intention to catch up with Jin Yuk as soon as possible. Jin Yuk assured her that he would be waiting. With that, they parted ways, each embarking on their separate journeys. A few days later, up on the ninth floor, Jin Yuk continued to put his new mask from Haru Yu to the test. In front of him were creatures unlike the goblins he'd faced earlier, but they didn't pose any real danger. Vulcan observed Jin Hyuk and asked for his thoughts, but Jin Hyuk was more interested in discussing Vulcan's role in extracting orc souls for creating orc soul soldiers. Vulcan remarked that creating waves seemed to be their new routine, to which Jin Hyuk suggested he not complain, although Vulcan assured him he was enjoying it. Vulcan couldn't help but notice Jin Hyuk's indifference as he'd never once mentioned Haru Yu during their floor clearing. Jin Yuk asked Vulcan what he meant, then revealed he wouldn't have accepted her as an ally if he knew she would fail. He recognized her strength and her unwavering desire for revenge. Jin Yuk then urged Vulcan to focus on bringing more orcs to complete their task, since the manual wave seemed insufficient. 
Vulcan, visibly angered, expressed disbelief at Jin Hyuk's apparent lack of respect for his elders and inquired about Jin Hyuk's parents. Jin Hyuk calmly stated he didn't have parents and questioned what was wrong with that. Vulcan was taken aback by this revelation. Jin Hyuk went on to explain that he was raised in an orphanage, shedding light on why he acted the way he did. In a moment of understanding, Vulcan placed a comforting hand on Jin Hyuk's shoulder and even asked for a hug. However, Jin Hyuk quickly recoiled, telling Vulcan to stay away because he despised pity. Despite this brief tension, Jin Hyuk soon achieved the Orc Slayer title. Now on the tenth floor, the Room of Trials, a notification appeared, stating they needed to defeat the boss to proceed. Failure meant going back to the ninth floor. A scoreboard displayed records of previous clears, all completed within a minute. Jin Hyuk noticed Vulcan's name was absent, and Vulcan pointed out that Jin Hyuk's name wasn't there either. Vulcan explained that most of the records belonged to members of the four great species due to their innate skills. Jin Hyuk suggested they attempt to break the record today, and Vulcan laughed in agreement. The system informed them of a one-minute preparation time before the boss battle. Jin Hyuk found the preparation time useful, especially for planning. Jin Hyuk instructed Vulcan to utilize his demon soul soldiers to immobilize the boss upon its spawn, to which Vulcan promptly summoned his soul soldiers, acknowledging his understanding. Jin Hyuk, with determination, placed his hand on the floor, activating a magic circle that materialized a magic spear. With a vow to demonstrate the prowess of a true master, he cast enchantments like piercing, dexterity, resilience, lethal and demonic energy on the spear, turning it a foreboding dark purple. Now Jin Hyuk, Vulcan and the Soul Soldier stood poised with the spear, eagerly awaiting the boss's arrival. As the preparation time elapsed, the moment of truth arrived, the countdown initiated with 3-2-1, summoning the formidable Great Orc Warrior. With resolute eyes, the massive Orc boss materialized before them, Acting swiftly, Vulcan commanded his soul soldiers to immobilize the orc, and they executed the order without delay. Jin Hyuk took aim and hurled the spear toward the orc. With incredible speed, the boss's head was severed, shattering the record in less than a second. The system offered Jin Hyuk the chance to immortalize his name, and he opted for Ghostface. The news rapidly spread as a notification was sent to everyone, confirming that the record-breaking feat was accomplished by Ghostface. It came as no surprise since our boy was the one who achieved this remarkable feat. In the eighth floor, the astonishment rippled through the crowd, including Haruyu, who realized she needed to intensify her training efforts. Vulcan couldn't contain his excitement, struggling to believe that they had triumphed so effortlessly. Shattering the records of the four great species was an inconceivable achievement, one that only our heroes had managed to accomplish. Now it was time for them to progress to the tenth floor, and Vulcan concurred, urging them to proceed and await Haruyu. Upon entering, Jinyuk received a notification indicating his arrival on the tenth floor. Accompanied by a boost of all his stats by plus five and the unlocking of the auction. The scene transitioned to a man tossing a gold coin into the air, observing the new record with satisfaction and musing. Ghost face, huh? A few days later, our heroes ascended to the tenth floor. The initial metropolis climbers would reach, home to the portal leading back to Earth. Consequently, those who gave up on climbing gained commercial rights and shaped the tower's largest city among the first hundred floors. Jin Hyuk decided to liquidate the remainder of his spoils intending to purchase potions and other consumables. As our hero continued to evaluate his new mask, Vulcan mentioned that the city had lifted its auction restrictions, yet the marketplace remained vibrant. Jin Yuk agreed, noting that there were individuals here leading ordinary lives, making it possible to acquire all necessities through auctions. While strolling through the city, persistent merchants pitched their services persistently mentioning the Gold Lich Inn. Vulcan's frustration mounted, prompting him to inquire about the term Gold Lich. Realizing Vulcan's unfamiliarity, Jin Yuk elucidated that Gold Lich Company 
was the premier enterprise that emerged years ago. However, Gold Lich referred to an individual, the wealthiest figure in the tower. His true name eluded the public, but rumour had it that an unimaginable amount of gold flowed through his hands. Vulcan, taken aback, questioned Jin Yuk's business agenda, prompting Jin Yuk to point at the Gold Lich Company logo and reveal that he was considering them for sponsorship. Vulcan was astounded, learning that Jin Hyuk intended to secure sponsorship from the Gold Lich. The scene shifted to a girl welcoming our heroes to the Gold Lich Company, where she explained that anything of value, be it weapons, loot, potions or information, could be bought and sold. She handed Jin Hyuk a waiting ticket, and Vulcan couldn't help but chuckle when he saw it was number 18, associated with the word fuck in Korean due to its similar pronunciation. After some time, number 18 was called, and a man named Halcyon, in charge of the third counter, introduced himself and asked how he could assist them. Jin Hyuk, revealing his mask, asked if it would suffice as identification. The man was left flabbergasted as he recognized the ghostly visage before him as Ghostface. Just as Halcyon was about to announce his name, Jin Hyuk silenced him reminding him of the reason he concealed his identity with the mask. Halcyon nodded in understanding, prompting Jin Yuk to request an assessment of his finances. He displayed 3,000 gold, the earnings he'd garnered from battling the waves. Halcyon inquired about Jin Yuk's intentions for such a substantial sum, to which Jin Yuk disclosed his desire for a meeting with the Gold Lich. Halcyon was taken aback, inwardly questioning Jin Yuk's sanity. Jin Yuk pressed for an explanation, reminding him that Halcyon had previously stated that anything could be bought and sold in this place. Halcyon regretfully explained that two reasons stood in the way. The gold lich was exceptionally occupied, and Jin Yuk's offer of 3,000 gold fell far short of the value the gold lich placed on his time. Jin Yuk inquired about the required amount for a meeting with the manager here. After some contemplation, Vulcan couldn't help but label Jin Hyuk as an asshole and enlisted a random employee to arrange a meeting with the company's head. Vulcan questioned what Halcyon had done to provoke Jin Hyuk's actions. In response, Jin Hyuk challenged Vulcan to suggest an alternative method to meet the Gold Lich, if he had one in mind. Facing a door, Jin Hyuk wondered if this was the end. He knocked and introduced himself as Ghostface. The voice inside invited him in, revealing a man seated in a chair who introduced himself as Puppet, the 10th floor branch manager of the Gold Lich Company. Puppet greeted the super rookie and inquired about Jin Yuk's desire to meet the Gold Lich. Jin Yuk affirmed his interest, but expressed doubt about the Gold Lich being present. Puppet apologized, citing the insufficiency of Jin Yuk's offered funds. Jin Yuk proposed an alternative. Have Puppet summon the Gold Lich first, confident that a meeting would secure his sponsorship. Puppet, while acknowledging his knowledge of Ghostface, expressed discomfort at Jin Yuk's casual discussion of the Gold Lich. Secretly, Puppet enacted his skill trait, Marionette, encircling Jin Hyuk with a marionette, its strings tightening around Jin Hyuk's neck. Inwardly, Puppet was confident in his ability to manipulate anyone ensnared by his strings and he regretfully informed Jin Hyuk that he would have to depart. However, to Puppet's astonishment, Jin Hyuk swiftly seized the strings and declared a wager on Puppet's arrogance, shattering the marionette. Puppet was left in disbelief, pondering how Jin Hyuk had managed to nullify a skill effective even against climbers on the 180th floor. Abruptly, Puppet brought his hands together, and both he and Jin Hyuk appeared to have shifted locations. Puppet remarked that this was likely Jin Hyuk's first encounter with this realm. As Puppet attempted to explain their whereabouts, Jin Hyuk interjected, identifying the place as the mind realm, a boundless dimension formed by separating the soul and mind from the body. Inwardly, Puppet questioned how a 10th the floor climber like Jin Hyuk could possess knowledge of this esoteric realm. Puppet proceeded to emphasize that, within this realm, the laws of reality held no sway. It was a dimension where one had to rely on their life experiences and the strength of their soul to engage in combat. Adopting a menacing demeanor, 
Puppet proposed that if Jin Hyuk wished to emerge victorious in this confrontation, he would endeavor to arrange a meeting with the Gold Lich. Puppet once again ensnared Jin Hyuk with his strings, but this time Jin Hyuk responded with a smirk, confidently stating, The power of one's experience and soul? You're no match for me then. Puppet, on the contrary, couldn't fathom how a newcomer on the 10th floor possessed such profound knowledge. Our hero appeared to have the mental acumen of at least a 100th floor climber, if not higher. Recognizing Jin Hyuk as his equal, Puppet knew he had to come up with a more dependable strategy. In that critical moment, he summoned his puppets, an army of controlled dolls surrounding Jin Hyuk. Puppet explained that in the realm of the mind, experience equated to strength, and these were puppets he'd acquired through his experiences. He disclosed that to ascend beyond the 100th floor, he had enhanced these puppets to be as formidable as a 50th floor climber when infused with mana. Brimming with confidence, Puppet asserted that the winner had already been decided the moment Jin Hyuk entered the mind realm. He then commanded his puppets to assail Jin Hyuk from all sides, engulfing him. Thinking it was over, Puppet reassured Jin Hyuk that injuries in the mind realm didn't carry over to the real world. Suddenly a colossal explosion erupted behind Puppet, and he turned around in a panic, realizing magic was in play. Emerging from the dark smoke was a menacing purple shadow, transforming into a skeletal mage. Puppet identified it as the Lich Mage and panicked, wondering why the 100th the floor boss monster was here. Jin Hyuk countered that it wasn't as simple as he thought, while Puppet was left wondering why his puppets were faltering. In a menacing tone, Jin Hyuk, now in his past life form, explained that materializing a deceased person in the mind realm took time, he assured Puppet that it wasn't as straightforward as he believed. Jin Hyuk found Puppet's puppet army laughable compared to his undead forces, a true embodiment of a formidable army. Jin Hyuk confidently declared that the victor had been decided the moment they entered the mind realm, emphasizing that mere puppets were puppets' downfall. Bewildered and unable to fathom the arrival of bosses above the 100th floor, Puppet screamed in terror, asking who Ghostface was. Jin Yuk unleashed his army upon Puppet, who let out a terrified scream. Abruptly, they were thrust back into reality. Puppet, sweating profusely, found himself disoriented, wondering when they had returned to the real world, since he hadn't even disbanded his own mental realm. He couldn't fathom how Jin Hyuk had taken control of the mind world. With Jin Hyuk firmly in control of the situation, he looked down at the overwhelmed puppet and admonished him to stop acting like a crybaby and to stand on his own two feet. He reminded Puppet of their bet, which was for Puppet to arrange a meeting between Jin Hyuk and Goldlich. Jin Hyuk then handed Puppet a letter. Puppet inquired if the letter was all there was, to which Jin Hyuk confirmed and instructed him to send it to Goldlich. While Puppet had lost, he couldn't guarantee a response to the letter. But Jin Hyuk exuded confidence that he would indeed receive a reply from Goldlich. With that, Jin Hyuk left. Once outside, Puppet assured Jin Hyuk that he would contact his lodging once he received a response. Jin Hyuk simply replied with an OK. As Jin Hyuk was departing, Puppet and Halcyon bowed, urging Jin Hyuk to return safely. As the sky began to cast its evening hues, Vulcan suggested they return to their lodging and rest. Jin Hyuk, however, questioned this and asked if there wasn't somewhere else they needed to go. Vulcan, perplexed, inquired if there was another destination. Jin Hyuk, sporting a mischievous grin, pointed out the inefficiency of waiting around for Gold Lich's arrival. Since they had time to kill, he emphasized the need to fulfill their responsibilities as guild members. The scene shifts to the White Swallow Guild House, one St. Floor lobby. A blonde girl turned to her friend and asked how far she'd climbed in the tower. Her friend replied, 57th floor. The blonde girl couldn't fathom why they were stuck in the 10th half floor lobby, questioning who would dare to enter the main door of the Holy Kingdom's affiliated guild. Suddenly, Jin Hyuk swung the door open, leaving the girls utterly shocked Swiftly regaining their composure, they maintained their professionalism and warmly welcomed Jin Hyuk to the White Swallow, 
inquiring about the purpose of his visit. Jin Hyuk, employing his acting skills, broke into a broad smile and replied, Raiding the tower alone has proven too challenging, so I'd like to join the guild. The girls were relieved to discover that an individual sought to join their guild, yet they suddenly paused, sharing a common concern. The potential for significant empowerment if they recommended a newcomer to the guild. After careful consideration, they enthusiastically welcomed Jin Hyuk, inquiring if he had a referrer or received a direct invitation. Jin Hyuk, still playing his part, feigned ignorance and mentioned that he came due to the guild's substantial affiliation. The two young women exchanged triumphant glances, convinced that Jin Hyuk was a novice unaware of their guild's intricacies. The blonde girl then requested Jin Hyuk to demonstrate his abilities. In response, Jin Yuk asked them for a coin and effortlessly bent it using his fingers, astonishing the girls. He then claimed proficiency in basic magic and ignited a fire on his hand as if to demonstrate, leaving the two girls bewildered. They were astounded by Jin Hyuk's array of talents and began whispering to each other, recognizing that his current skills were not the crux of the matter. They believed that by guiding him, Jin Hyuk had the potential to become a tycoon. The blonde girl, adding a touch of jest, remarked on Jin Hyuk's good looks, prompting her friend to question if he was truly her type. With a sly grin, Jin Hyuk thought that he had bought enough time, anticipating something to unfold soon. However, a sudden noise interrupted their conversation, and the girls wondered about its origin. Without delay, a man rushed into the guildhouse, expressing urgent concern about a rampaging spirit monster wreaking havoc in the village. He urged everyone who had reached the 50th floor to assemble immediately. Amidst this critical moment, the two girls requested Jin Hyuk to wait in the guild as they resolved this emergency. As they exited and shut the door behind them, Jin Hyuk donned his mask once more, declaring that it was time to revert to his menacing alter ego, Ghostface, standing there with his new drip. Back outside, chaos reigned as people fled for their lives. Climbers attempted to confront the supposed crazy spirit, only to discover that their attacks were utterly ineffectual. Unbeknownst to them, this so-called crazy spirit was, in fact, Vulcan, consumed by resentment over the mockery of his awkward appearance. Blushing with shame, Vulcan inwardly cursed Jin Hyuk for subjecting the first spirit master to such humiliation, vowing never to forgive him. Meanwhile, Jin Hyuk was engaged in physical altercations with individuals, seemingly searching for something. Another person emerged from a nearby room, bewildered by the commotion, and inquired about the situation. Jin Hyuk's response was swift, as he grasped the man by the neck, hoisting him into the air. He noticed a plethora of books inside the room the man had come from and demanded information. Jin Hyuk explained that given their guild's affiliation with the Holy Kingdom, he required a list of other guilds and their precise locations. The gasping man questioned Jin Hyuk's wisdom in making enemies of two members of the Nine Star. Jin Hyuk expressed gratitude for the man's concern, but warned that now was not the time to worry about others. Terrified, the man reluctantly pointed toward a desk inside the room he'd exited. Jin Hyuk thanked him for not wasting his time, releasing his grip. As Jin Hyuk perused the papers on the table, he discovered information about the Pelon siblings, realizing that the individuals before him were their pawns. He silently vowed to bring them all under his control, burning the papers as a symbolic gesture of his intent to dismantle them slowly. The scene shifted to Gold Lich, who was reviewing reports when an envelope slipped from the stack, catching his attention. Intrigued, he opened the letter, wondering why Puppet had sent a separate message alongside the reports. As he read the contents, a moment of eerie silence enveloped him, followed by a nervous, sweat-inducing realization. Gold Lich exclaimed, Ghostface, how in the world do you know about this? Due to Jin Hyuk's involvement in igniting the building, a massive fire, suspected to be an act of arson, engulfed the village. Unfortunately, all witnesses on the scene perished. Beck Hallio, the guild master of the White Swallow, expressed suspicion about a prospective recruit. Beck inquired about the individual's appearance and attire from two young women. 
Strikingly, their descriptions of Jinyuk differed. The blonde girl depicted him as a handsome man with a prominent nose bridge, while her friend described him as unattractive with a short stubby nose. They exchanged shocked glances, realizing Jin Hyuk might have employed hallucination magic. The narrative shifts to Jin Hyuk in a room, where Vulcan emerged from a portal and Jin Hyuk praised his performance. With an arrogant grin, Jin Hyuk mentioned rumors about a fearsome ghost. Vulcan, frustrated, questioned if he was mocking him. He also inquired if Jin Hyuk had completed his mission without detection. Jin Hyuk confidently admitted to using effective hallucination magic, causing everyone to remember him differently. When Vulcan asked about the gathered information on other guilds, Jin Hyuk stated that having it in his mind sufficed. Suddenly, a knock at the door interrupted them. Vulcan asked if Jin Hyuk had requested room service, but Jin Hyuk denied it. He donned his mask and devised a plan. He'd open the door on the count of three, and Vulcan would apprehend the visitor. Jin Hyuk counted one, two, three, and Vulcan swiftly summoned chains to capture the knocker, revealing it was Halcyon. Halcyon informed Jin Hyuk that Puppet had sent him to convey that the Gold Lich had arrived at the 10th floor branch. Upon reaching the 10th floor, they encountered numerous knights. Jin Hyuk inquired about the Gold Lich's whereabouts, and the Gold Lich himself acknowledged Jin Hyuk's audacity and commended his courage for showing up. With a menacing demeanor, the Gold Lich warned Jin Hyuk of a steep price to pay, declaring that individuals who possessed knowledge of certain matters couldn't exist within the tower. As the Gold Lich departed, he ordered the knights to escort Jin Hyuk, barely clinging to life to his room. Jin Hyuk's demeanor turned menacing as he challenged the knight leader, asking if he desired a fight. In response, the knight leader ordered his comrades to prepare for battle, but before they could react, Jin Hyuk delivered a powerful punch to the leader while chastising him for foolishly revealing their strategy. The other knights watched in shock as their captain lay defeated. Without hesitation, Jin Hyuk swiftly incapacitated all the standing knights and then advanced towards Gold Lich, wielding the knight's equipment. Gold Lich, in a dramatic turn, caused the gold coins around him to levitate, almost resembling liquid. The coins transformed into projectiles and barraged Jin Hyuk relentlessly. Internally, Jin Hyuk recognized this power as golden power, where Gold Lich converted gold into mana for his attacks. Jin Hyuk skillfully deflected the onslaught of coins and questioned if that was all Gold Lich had to offer. However, Gold Lich wasn't finished. He morphed the gold into sharp, pointed blades, warning Jin Hyuk that the majority of the gold in the branch could unleash a devastating wave. Even if it's the so-called ghost face, he will be critically injured. Just as an explosion occurred around Jin Hyuk, seemingly ending the confrontation, Jin Hyuk surprised Gold Lich by revealing he wasn't defeated. He held a spear to Gold Lich's neck, claiming victory in their verbal battle. Pushing away the spear, Gold Lich arrogantly remarked that he could easily eliminate someone like Jin Hyuk if he wished. To Gold Lich's shock, Jin Hyuk countered, stating that he couldn't be killed. Jin Hyuk emphasized that Gold Lich hadn't inquired about his information source and that they intended to capture him alive. Jin Hyuk offered to reveal his source, leading Gold Lich to request his presence in a grand room. Jin Hyuk marveled at the opulence of the room, acknowledging the power of money. Gold Lich then activated his power, creating sharp blades that sealed them off from the outside world. He demanded to know the person who had informed Jin Hyuk about his ownership of the auction. The auction serves as an expansive system enabling the trading of items within the tower. However, this intricate system wasn't a natural occurrence within the tower. It was crafted by a singular individual, Gold Lich. Internally, Gold Lich harbors concerns that the exposure of this truth could undermine the very foundation of his Gold Lich enterprise. With a fiery glare, Gold Lich interrogates Jin Hyuk, inquiring about the source of the information that implicated him as the auction's owner. Jin Hyuk, donning a smirk, playfully reveals that it was merely a ruse devoid of any concrete origin. Unsatisfied with Jin Hyuk's response, 
Goldlich forges a substantial golden labrise, brandishing it menacingly while questioning if the loss of an arm and leg wouldn't severely hinder Jin Hyuk. As Goldlich launches his assault, Vulcan materializes and delivers a powerful punch, shattering the formidable Labrise into fragments. Goldlich's eyes widen in astonishment as he comprehends that Jin Hyuk has employed a soul soldier. Maintaining some distance from Jin Hyuk, Goldlich astutely observes that only a spirit master possesses the capability to wield soul soldiers, prompting him to inquire how Jin Hyuk has acquired this skill, prompting Jin Hyuk to remove his mask revealing a wide grin as he addresses Goldlich by his true name, Creditor William. Acknowledging Jinyuk, Goldlich queries how is he still alive. Jinyuk proceeds to recount the events of the raid on the 600th floor, the betrayal by the Nine Star, Bale's bestowed gift, and his subsequent resurrection. Goldlich is left deep in thought, hearing this narrative for the first time, while Vulcan regards Jinyuk with newfound interest. Goldlich then conveys his disbelief in standing before the person he thought was Cha Jin Hyuk. Jin Hyuk counters by affirming that his identity remains unchanged, albeit with a dash of surprise. Goldlich subsequently inquires about Jin Hyuk's motives, to which Jin Hyuk responds by expressing his need for financial assistance from the Goldlich company. He proposes a sponsorship type contract. Goldlich, however, asserts that Jin Hyuk shouldn't speak of the company as if it were his own. Jin Hyuk rebuts this by emphasizing his significant contributions, highlighting his role as a founding contributor and the largest shareholder of the Goldlich Company. Noting Jin Hyuk's assertiveness, Goldlich remarks that he finally perceives the true Jin Hyuk in their conversation. Jin Hyuk humorously quips that he is indeed the genuine Cha Jin Hyuk. Goldlich then underscores the necessity for reciprocity, even if Jin Hyuk is, without a doubt, the authentic Jin Hyuk emphasizing that a contract requires both parties to contribute. Jin Hyuk proceeds to offer valuable insights he's deduced from the wealth of information he's collected and synthesized over time. Goldlich, intrigued, agrees, but mentions that the price will be determined after hearing Jin Hyuk's revelations. With a focused demeanor, Jin Hyuk begins by revealing the Nine Stars' sinister plan to undermine him. He posits that this implies the existence of a mastermind orchestrating the scheme, given the strong-willed nature of the siblings, making them unlikely to cooperate unless commanded by a power higher than them. That higher authority, he asserts, can only be the tower's four monarchs. Goldlich is visibly astounded and asks Jin Hyuk to pause, inquiring if he is referring to the tower's four royalties. Jin Hyuk confirms this and explains that the four royalties are driven by the desire to preserve the dominance of their respective species. With other species ascending the tower which has emerged as a realm from another world, their influence diminishes. As a result, they aim to reach the tower's summit or eliminate potential threats that could challenge their supremacy. Those who partake in this struggle stand to become rulers of their respective flaws. Goldlich queries if this is the extent of Jin Hyuk's deductions especially since Jin Hyuk was the primary victim in this situation. Guys, they changed Dokebi to Oni. Jin Hyuk reveals that the Oni village on the 100th floor possesses this knowledge. He further adds that he is aware of the sole survivor of that catastrophic event, a young Oni girl named Haryu. The scene transitions to Haryu decapitating an orc, and she inwardly laments that it's still insufficient. To defeat the orc boss, she must significantly augment her strength. Her struggles with the 10th floor boss challenge weigh heavily on her mind. Inwardly, she resolves that to reunite with Jin Hyuk, she must undergo a substantial transformation. Suddenly, her sword queries why she's groaning when she simply needs to utilize its power. The sword suggests that dispatching the orc boss would be effortless with its assistance. However, Haryu declines, citing her promise to Jin Hyuk not to wield the Dragon Slayer sword's might. She firmly asserts her commitment to growing stronger on her own and requests the sword not to engage her in conversation. Goldlich then voices his puzzlement. During that fierce conflict, the Onis dispatched only a young child and a sword. Jin Hyuk confirms that Haryu and the sword are indeed the targets. He elaborates that to eliminate a single young Oni, they decimated the entire species. 
In essence, they're handicapping themselves. Inwardly, Goldlich acknowledges the implausibility, but recognizes that it would explain everything. Jin Yuk rises and declares his motive as revenge. He vows to obliterate everyone, including the Nine Star, the supporters of the Four Royalties, and the Four Royalties who murdered Goldlich's family. With his newfound trust in Jin Hyuk, Goldlich channels power from the outside world. Just then, Baal arrives, inquiring about Jin Hyuk and Goldlich's discussion. The nine-tailed fox chimes in with an unrelated remark, irritating Jin Hyuk, who snaps at them to be quiet and not disrupt the atmosphere. Goldlich, finally accepting Jin Hyuk's offer, expresses his willingness to provide Jin Hyuk with his insights. Still somewhat skeptical, he challenges Jin Hyuk to prove that he is truly Cha Jin Hyuk at this moment. Jin Hyuk lets out a weary sigh and questions whether he truly lacked trust to this extent. He inquires of Gold Lich whether such an extreme measure is necessary. The Gold Lich responds by emphasizing his role as a merchant, where trust holds immense value and is not something he can afford to take lightly. Jin Hyuk finds this rather irksome prompting him to reach out to Baal for a character reference. Jin Hyuk proposes a handshake, but Baal, still hesitant, requests not one but three handshakes as a condition for vouching for him. Jin Hyuk agrees and completes the handshakes. With his title, Peak of All Evil, on the line, Baal vouches for Jin Hyuk. Gold Lich, compelled by this display of trust, offers his hand for a handshake and expresses his willingness to believe Jin Hyuk. As their hands meet, Jin Hyuk wastes no time in presenting his initial request to his sponsor. Gold Lich accepts and assures him that if it's something purchasable, he'll acquire it promptly. Jin Hyuk, resolute in his purpose, reveals his need for an extensive array of weapons suitable for use within the tower, along with plenty of spares. Gold Lich, puzzled, questions Jin Hyuk's motives, reminding him that he's a spirit master and asking if he's going to start a war on the tenth floor. Jin Yuk grins and inquires whether Gold Lich is familiar with the term All Master, showcasing his status window as evidence. Upon seeing the All Master class designation, Gold Lich is left dumbfounded, realizing the significance of Jin Hyuk's newfound strength. Jin Hyuk proceeds to explain that the All Master class, as the name implies, enhances all of his stats, even for weapons he's never wielded before. It imparts a profound sense of familiarity, as if he has years of experience with each weapon. Inwardly, Gold Lich acknowledges that while Jin Hyuk may be currently weaker due to reincarnation, his potential has skyrocketed. Gold Lich decides that his priority should be to exponentially increase Jin Hyuk's potential and promptly summons Puppet. Puppet enters, inquiring if their conversation has concluded. Gold Lich then tasks Puppet with procuring and gathering all the weapons available on the 10th floor, discreetly using various company names to avoid suspicion. Presenting his golden card, Gold Lich instructs Puppet to label the weapons as VVIP. After some time, Puppet returns, holding a single piece of clothing. This leaves Jin Hyuk perplexed, as he had expected a much larger assortment of weaponry. Puppet informs Jin Hyuk that all the weapons he requested are actually stored inside the coat. Initially perplexed, Jin Hyuk's confusion dissipates as Goldlich grins and reveals the coat's true nature, a subspace coat. This remarkable coat possesses a lining that connects to a subspace, capable of storing as many inanimate objects as a large storage room could. Furthermore, its temperature, size and color are adjustable at the user's will, and it's enchanted with protective magic. Goldlich emphasizes that this item is exceptionally rare within the tower and advises Jin Yuk to use it with care. With his newfound drip, Jin Yuk playfully suggests that Goldlich should also exercise caution, given Jin Yuk's ambitious spending habits. The scene transitions to a portal opening, and Kim, along with his two companions, emerges from it, barely clinging to life. One of them in blue notes that since they challenged the boss as a party, they didn't earn any achievements, but they survived thanks to Kim's support item. The one in orange laments that they've exhausted all their resources before reaching the 10th floor and questions how they'll continue their climb. Kim, wearing a joyful expression, 
reassures them by mentioning the White Swallow Guild's presence on the 10th floor, suggesting they'll find support there. However, his thoughts secretly turn to Jin Hyuk, now identified as Ghostface. He clenches his teeth in anger and vows to make Jin Hyuk pay for the humiliation and threats. Returning to a cheerful demeanor, Kim informs his companions that they're about to enter the bloody revenge battle. Upon arrival, they are shocked to discover the building in ruins. Night falls, and they learn that other guild members have evacuated to the 30th floor. With limited skills and resources, they ask Kim for guidance, realizing the challenge of reaching the 30th floor under these circumstances. As Kim remains silent, the man in blue prompts him to say something while the man in orange expresses their trust in Kim, highlighting that aside from his guild affiliation, he's nothing special. Internally, Kim seethes with frustration, considering his companions useless. He contemplates using this opportunity to rid himself of them, believing they wouldn't have passed the 10th floor without his help. Suddenly, their attention is drawn to a trembling and whimpering baby fox on the street. Kim, irritated by their lack of food to offer, scolds the fox when it dares to lick his foot. Frustration boils over, and Kim cruelly kicks the defenseless creature, causing it to cry out in pain. In a moment of cruelty, Kim vents his own stress by relentlessly kicking the fox while cursing his misfortune and lamenting that everything in his life seems to go wrong. Then, a glimmer of light appears in a dark alley and in a flash, Kim's foot is severed by a swift knife strike, leaving him bewildered. Menacingly, Jin Hyuk commands him to cease his brutality, warning that it will take time to tend to the injured fox. Kim, racked with pain, pleads for the stranger's identity. But Jin Hyuk ominously proclaims that he's about to become the owner of the very fox Kim callously mistreated. A few moments earlier, Jin Hyuk strolled through the streets alongside Vulcan. Jin Yuk mentioned they had one final destination in mind, the Tower of Class Advancement to harness spirit power. Vulcan Inquisitive inquired about the purpose, as Jin Yuk was already a spirit master. Jin Yuk explained that his class advancement was akin to becoming an all-master and regaining memories from his previous life. Although he had yet to acquire spirit power through cultivation, Vulcan pondered the idea. Jin Hyuk suggested they take a break from spending the Golden Lich's wealth tonight. Suddenly, a notification alerted them that the Nine-Tailed Fox had detected something. Bale pointed in a specific direction, prompting Jin Hyuk to look. As they gazed in that direction, the Nine-Tailed Fox fell silent, leaving Jin Hyuk curious. She eventually requested his assistance, revealing that her baby was in peril, bringing us to the present moment. Jin Yuk was taken aback by the unexpected encounter with the offspring of the mystical nine-tailed fox in such an unlikely place. The nine-tailed fox also presented him with a quest to rescue the baby fox, a disciple of the neutral god, and herself. After the rescue, she asked Jin Hyuk to care for the fox, promising a reward, an item that would increase his rapport with her. The first reward would be granted upon the rescue, and the second after the fox's recovery. Internally, Jin Hyuk considered this an unforeseen stroke of luck. Kim, recognizing the distinctive mark on Jin Hyuk's attire, identified the one who had severed his leg as Ghostface. Jin Hyuk, casting a critical gaze upon Kim, questioned where he had encountered Kim before. Enraged, Kim accused Jin Hyuk of provoking him in this manner and ordered his two companions to attack. As they lunged at Jin Hyuk, he vanished from his position, leaving them bewildered. They frantically inquired about his whereabouts until they spotted Jin Hyuk sprinting while cradling the baby fox. Jin Hyuk then confronted Kim, asking if he had intentionally harmed the fox, emphasizing its significance as his last ounce of good fortune. Struggling to rise, Kim asked why it mattered, threatening to sever Jin Hyuk's leg in the same manner. Jin Yuk turned to the nine-tailed fox for guidance on how to deal with Kim and his companions. Without hesitation, the nine-tailed fox urged Jin Yuk to eliminate them. Kim swiftly instructed his companions to encircle Jin Yuk, preventing any escape. Unperturbed, Jin Yuk casually tossed Kim's severed leg back to him, baffling Kim. 
In that very moment, Jin Hyuk unleashed the skill, Corpse Explosion, detonating the leg and swiftly ending the trio's lives. Back at their dwelling, Jin Hyuk contemplated giving the fox a name, as continually referring to it as the baby fox was impractical. He considered abbreviating its name but realized that box didn't sit well with the fox. Vulcan and the nine-tailed fox concurred, foreseeing potential consequences when the fox grew up. Jin Yuk sought Vulcan's suggestion for a better name. With enthusiasm, Vulcan proposed Horang, combining Ho, meaning fox, and Rang, meaning bright. However, Jin Hyuk and the two foxes didn't seem pleased with the choice. Given that it was a two-tailed fox, Jin Hyuk decided to name it Miho. Its full name, Lee Miho, signified two-tailed fox in Korean. Vulcan playfully questioned if Miho, being a picky fox, was content with the name. Miho's expression indicated its acceptance. A system notification then declared that the partial quest had been fulfilled, and Jin Hyuk had saved the nine-tailed fox's offspring, Miho, bestowing a reward. An energy ball manifested above Miho's head, forming a fox mask. This mask granted the user access to the fox's abilities, its strength increasing in tandem with the owner's power. Holding it, Jin Hyuk compared it to his Oni mask, internally recognizing the allure of the charm skill for detaining opponents. However, the nine-tailed fox reminded him that the quest was ongoing and emphasized the need to restore Miho's vitality. A second quest materialized, requiring Jin Hyuk to feed Miho 999 fresh raw livers to aid in its recovery. The reward for this endeavor would be an increase in friendship with the nine-tailed fox. Jin Hyuk realized that obtaining 999 fresh livers personally would be quite a task, but he accepted it, acknowledging the value of the mask and understanding that there was no other choice. Wearing a sly grin and aware of the benefits of gaining favor, Jin Hyuk expressed his anticipation for what lay ahead. With everything in order, Vulcan mentioned his intention to go for a leisurely walk. As Vulcan made his exit, Jin Hyuk instructed him that when dawn broke, they would head to the Tower of Class Advancement. He emphasized that if Vulcan believed he might be running late, he should proceed directly to the tower. Vulcan soared above the city, noting the stark contrast it presented compared to his earlier ascent of the tower. However, an unsettling feeling washed over him. Recognizing the sensation, Vulcan sought refuge behind a building observing the people passing by. It wasn't long before he spotted a dragon, unmistakable due to its horns and the savage mana emanating from the creature. The dragon let out a sigh and wearing a menacing expression, declared its intent to exterminate all dragons. Vulcan was left in shock, acknowledging that dragons were known for their narcissism and the way they often portrayed familial love. They were the proudest among the four royalties, the notion of a dragon vowing to eradicate its own kin was utterly unbelievable. With a deep sense of concern, Vulcan expressed his worry that the dragons would soon come to the 10th floor. One girl whispers to her friend, Look, that dragon is perched in that spot again. Her friend acknowledges, noting that the dragon has maintained its position for several days. The other girl adds, And it's muttering gibberish that makes no sense. For a few days, Vulcan mutters, perplexed. Internally, he questions why the dragons have taken no action. Suddenly, the dragon's gaze locks onto Vulcan, sparking nervousness as he wonders whether the dragon has sensed his manner. The dragon identifies Vulcan as the insignificant ghost, play-acting awkwardly. Vulcan takes offense at this description and jumps to confront the dragon menacingly. He declares that the dragon, unaware of his true strength, should grasp the extent of his power. Vulcan even taunts the dragon as a young dragon. This enrages the dragon, who clenches his teeth in anger, demanding to know how Vulcan dares to call him a dragon and if he wishes to face death. Meanwhile, on the outskirts of the 10th floor, Jin Hyuk approaches the Tower of Class Change. He mutters his frustration, cursing Vulcan for not returning and wondering why Vulcan hasn't responded to his telepathic messages. Jin Hyuk opens the door to the tower, only to find it deserted. His attention shifts to a voice introducing itself. 
the man with disheveled hair and a mark on his forehead, warmly welcomes Jin Hyuk and introduces himself as Ken, the climber responsible for the Tower of Class change. Jin Hyuk remarks on the desolation, and Ken explains that few people on the tenth floor awaken their mana. It's practically a ghost town, Jin Hyuk comments. Jin Hyuk expresses his desire to use the necromancer's room and asks Ken if it's possible. Ken agrees but requests proof of Jin Hyuk's awakened mana by having him infuse a crystal orb with mana. Jin Hyuk inquires if he needs to channel the mana into it and Ken confirms. Jin Hyuk places his hand on the orb and begins to infuse it with his dark and mesmerizing purple mana. The power is so overwhelming that Ken can't believe it. He wonders how a ten-the-floor climber possesses such potent mana. The orb becomes so saturated that it starts to crack and eventually shatters into numerous pieces. Ken's astonishment at the shattered crystal orb was so profound that he tumbled to the floor, unable to comprehend what had just transpired. Unperturbed, Jin Yuk casually inquired about the location of the necromancer's room. Meanwhile, Vulcan engaged in a fierce battle with the dragon, his struggle evident. Internally, he fretted about not being with Jin Hyuk, limiting his mana and soul resources. Sporting a sinister grin, the dragon taunted Vulcan, questioning how long he intended to hide behind souls and urging him to face the fight head on. A bystander recognized the dragon's distinctive horns, confirming that he was indeed a dragon, a statement that infuriated the dragon. He turned towards the bystanders, angrily demanding they be quiet and questioning who they were calling a dragon. The bystanders fled in fear. Observing this, Vulcan concluded that the man was unquestionably a dragon, but reacted sensitively to the term. It was as if his body and soul had been separated, prompting Vulcan to wonder if such a phenomenon was possible. Suddenly Vulcan recalled that a similar occurrence had befallen Jin Hyuk. His fascination brimming, he summoned a soul soldier and transformed it into a weapon, leaving the dragon astounded. Vulcan declared his intention to investigate the substance within the dragon's body and unleashed a soul laser, narrowly missing the dragon, whose coat bore the brunt of the attack. The dragon acknowledged Vulcan's strength, acknowledging that he was no mere ghost. Vulcan then employed spirit power, a magical technique that consumed souls as if they were mana a skill even Jin Hyuk couldn't wield yet. Vulcan confidently asserted that he was Vulcan, the first spirit master, and would make sure the dragon regretted picking a fight, all while launching an assault. As the dragon dodged, he sarcastically asked if they were introducing themselves now, appearing beside Vulcan to clash weapons. The dragon identified himself as Hendrik, the dragon slayer, declaring that he was the human who would send Vulcan to Nirvana. A dragon slayer, Vulcan repeated, pondering how a potent soul like that ended up within a dragon's body. Hendrik unleashed his attack, the flowing dragon ride, forcing both combatants to create some distance. Vulcan realized his earlier carelessness, having underestimated Hendrik as a young dragon. If indeed there was a dragon slayer's soul within the dragon's body, and they were a climber of the 7,800th floor, Vulcan understood that even with Jin Hyuk's arrival, victory against Hendrik was far from guaranteed. With agility, Vulcan evaded Hendrik's attack and launched a counter-offensive. But Hendrik scoffed, questioning whether Vulcan truly believed he would fall for the same trick again. Just as Hendrik was about to evade, Vulcan utilized Soul Bind to seize Hendrik, rendering him immobile. Vulcan then unleashed a massive attack, directing it at Hendrik. However, Hendrik countered with his own technique, 10,000 slashes, slicing through the spirit arms that held him. Suddenly, Hendrik's attention shifted to a colossal spirit hand hurtling towards him. This attack, Soulbind Giant, was executed by Vulcan and was of colossal proportions. It struck right where Hendrik stood, causing significant damage to the surroundings and the village. After that intense battle, Vulcan breathed a sigh of relief. It had been a close fight, and he'd exhausted all the mana and souls Jin Hyuk had temporarily provided. Surveying the damage, Vulcan observed that the dragon wouldn't be able to move for some time, giving him the chance to escape. 
However, a few seconds later, a crack appeared on the giant shadow hand, and the dragon broke free from its grasp. He breathed heavily, called Vulcan's name, and then burst into boisterous laughter. He vowed to personally slice Vulcan into pieces the next time they met, raising his sword as a solemn oath. Meanwhile, Jin Hyuk conversed with the yellow-haired man about the numerous rooms in the area. The man noted the diversity of magic paths and couldn't help but wonder about Jin Hyuk, a 10-the-floor climber who even a 35-the-floor climber couldn't contend with. Recalling the man's name, Ken, Jin Hyuk admitted that he was an all-right mage and a useful guide. As they reached their destination, Ken introduced it as the Necromancer Room. Jin Hyuk observed the reagents' corpses and books, noting that it was a room that necromancers dream of. Ken assured Jin Hyuk that if he needed anything, he should let him know, to which Jin Hyuk replied, Sure. As Jin Hyuk began to prepare, Vulcan suddenly appeared, startling the small fox. Jin Hyuk inquired about Vulcan's whereabouts, and Vulcan reassured him, explaining that he had been a bit rough during his morning exercise. Vulcan noted that it seemed Jin Hyuk was about to get started. Jin Hyuk confirmed and with a snap of his fingers, he commanded his spirit soldiers to get to work. They engaged in various tasks, some taking books, others drawing magic circles and a few lighting candles. After all the preparations, Jin Hyuk settled in the middle of the circle, surrounded by books and candles in a meditation pose. Miho, the small fox, noticed Jin Hyuk closing his eyes and wondered what was happening, but Vulcan picked her up and suggested they stand back for now. Jin Hyuk addressed Vulcan, saying that this might be his last command, and asked Vulcan to protect his body until he woke up. With a wicked grin, Vulcan warned Jin Hyuk to be careful, because if he died, he'd take over his body. Suddenly, as Jin Hyuk initiated the ritual, a ghost appeared and gazed at him before entering inside his chest, startling Miho. Vulcan assured Miho that everything was going well and explained that spirit power was a unique quality of a necromancer mage, allowing them to use souls as if they were mana. The quickest way to awaken one's spirit power was to be in a soul state, meaning they needed to die once. Vulcan keenly observed the change and realized that Jin Hyuk had entered the soul world. A voice rang out proclaiming ownership of Jin Hyuk's body. Countless green souls materialized, all vying to seize Jin Hyuk's body to gain a chance at life once more. Witnessing the chaos, Vulcan rallied his soul soldiers and instructed them to defend their master from the deceased souls. He summoned additional spirit soldiers to confront the green souls. Suddenly Ken entered the necromancer room, bewildered by the commotion. He couldn't help but clutch his head and exclaim in frustration at the pandemonium. Vulcan, trying to regain control, asked Ken if he was a manager there and requested his assistance. Meanwhile, Miho trembled in terror, hiding behind some books. However, she noticed a green soul about to attack Jin Hyuk. Just as the green soul lunged, Ken noticed the impending danger and alerted Vulcan. In a state of panic, Vulcan urgently implored Jin Hyuk to regain control because his body was on the verge of being stolen. Suddenly, Miho leapt between Jin Hyuk and the green ghost. She unleashed an attack, her body emitting a pink and black glow appearing as if she was struggling but determined to save her saviour, Jin Hyuk. The whole crowd was left in awe by Miho's actions, leaving the green ghosts bewildered and questioning the source of the dazzling light. Upon closer inspection, their eyes formed heart shapes as they found Miho irresistibly charming and they fell to the floor, overwhelmed by her cuteness. Even Vulcan, his spirit soldiers and Ken weren't immune to Miho's enchanting skill. Back to his senses, Vulcan quickly snapped Ken out of his daze. Inwardly, Vulcan speculated that this skill might be a form of charm, one that not only controlled desires, but also ensnared souls. He considered that Miho's divine heritage might make her different. Suddenly, a towering green spirit appeared, clearly agitated by the commotion. Spotting Jin Hyuk, he remarked on the chaos. Vulcan nervously identified this giant spirit as a named, signifying he was a strong climber when he was alive. 
Vulcan understood the danger if he possessed Jin Yuk's body, as the spirit eyed it hungrily. The giant spirit's interest in Jin Yuk's body was unsettling. Vulcan realized he needed to intervene, but was still under the influence of Miho's charm. He urgently implored her to stop the giant green spirit. In response, the spirit told Miho to move aside, showing no interest in her. Undeterred, Miho leapt at the spirit, preparing to use her powers. However, as she unleashed her abilities, she felt drained, leaving Vulcan to question if that was her limit. The massive spirit raised his sword, prepared to strike Miho. She braced herself for the impact. Unexpectedly, Jin Hyuk raised his finger and unleashed a dark aura beam at the spirit, astonishing Vulcan. Jin Hyuk thanked Miho and pointed at the spirit, calling him a bastard. The spirit screamed in terror as Jin Hyuk's attack damaged his spirit form. Jin Hyuk declared that even as a ghost, the giant spirit would serve as a powerful bullet, absorbing the smaller green ghost that was unconscious on the floor. The giant spirit confronted Jin Hyuk, but he responded with a menacing glare and unleashed a barrage of dark purple energy bullets using his skill, Ten-Fingered Soul Bullet, obliterating the spirit and the wall behind the spirit. Vulcan marveled at Jin Hyuk's ability to gather spirit power on his fingertips and deliver such a devastating attack. Observing the aftermath and the destroyed wall, Jin Yuk removed his mask and casually responded to Vulcan, acknowledging that the attack wasn't too shabby. Sometime later, Puppet arrived at the scene and was taken aback by the chaos. He asked what it took to turn the tower into such a mess. Jin Yuk briefly explained that it was a long story and then inquired about the purpose of Puppet's visit. Puppet explained that he came to deliver items to Jin Yuk. Among the requested items were deadly poisons of varying potencies, a fire stone filled with fire energy, and a frost stone containing ice energy. Vulcan remarked that Puppet was faster than expected. Jin Yuk questioned why Puppet was giving him these items when they were meant for raids on floors above the 100th. Puppet replied with a smile, mentioning that this was his final task as the branch manager of the 10th floor. He expressed his intention to return as a climber, to become stronger, setting the tower's pinnacle as his goal. Puppet believed Jin Yuk would bring significant changes to the tower, and with his skills from the 100th floor, he could become the best merchant. Jin Hyuk admired Puppet's determination, noting that he was somewhat like Gold Lich in the past. Holding the case, Jin Hyuk assured Puppet that once he obtained the necessary skills, he would share his and Gold Lich's plans. Puppet thanked Jin Hyuk and left in a carriage. Jin Hyuk and Vulcan watched Puppet's departure from the damaged wall. Vulcan commented on Puppet's departure, and Jin Hyuk decided it was time to indulge. He sat down and expressed his intention to consume the crystals. Vulcan questioned if there was another reason to which Jin Hyuk explained that his gluttony trait would absorb the power of the things he ate. As he prepared to ingest the crystals, he asked Vulcan if he wasn't curious about the powers he would gain from consuming them. After that, Ken awakens, and he suddenly starts screaming while anxiously warning Jin Hyuk that it's dangerous, likely from a nightmare. Vulcan notices that Ken seems disoriented, so he inquires if he's okay. Ken then asks about Jin Hyuk and the fox, Vulcan reassures him that both are fine, but his tone shifts as he glimpses something concerning. Ken queries him about this, just as a piercing scream echoes through the room. The scream emanates from Jin Hyuk, who writhes in agony while devouring the Firestone. Miho trembles and watches him with concern. The nine-tailed fox becomes furious, warning Jin Hyuk not to display such behaviors in front of her offspring. Jin Hyuk employs his skill gluttony, kneeling amidst the flames and after a few moments successfully consumes the stone. The system then notifies him that he has gained burn resistance. Holding a vial of poison, Jin Hyuk declares that it's now time to acquire poison resistance. Moments later, the spirit soldiers are observed gathering the lifeless orcs into a substantial pile. Jin Hyuk then complains that his stomach hurts prompting Vulcan to question why he's subjecting himself to such pain. Jin Hyuk asks him to clarify torturing, stating that he needs all of it. Frustrated, Vulcan remarks 
that Jin Hyuk's resilience in drinking all that poison makes him quite tenacious. Jin Hyuk explains that he had previously informed Vulcan about the combat techniques of the Nine Star, necessitating his preparation by acquiring resistance to various elements. Meanwhile, numerous notifications appear behind Jin Hyuk, revealing his newfound resistances to all poisons, burn resistance and freeze resistance. Jin Hyuk emphasizes the importance of poison resistance, as one of the nine star members specializes in poisons. And had he been aware of their tricks, he wouldn't have met such a gruesome fate. Suddenly a spirit soldier arrives, and Vulcan asks if these are all the orcs in the vicinity. The spirit soldier nods in agreement. Gazing at Miho, Jin Yuk mentions that she has waited long enough, and it's her turn to eat. Vulcan suggests removing the liver and feeding it to her, to which Jin Hyuk agrees, noting that Miho is still a baby when considering her as a human. However, Miho takes everyone by surprise when she suddenly reveals menacing, razor-sharp carnivorous teeth and begins devouring the deceased orcs. Jin Hyuk and Vulcan are left in shock. Once Miho finishes her gruesome feast, a notification indicates her progress in part two of the quest, showing that she's consumed 127 raw livers out of 999. Jin Yuk expresses a desire to create a wave, but he hesitates due to the city's size, not wanting to draw too much attention. He then inquires about who Vulcan was fighting the previous night. Vulcan, somewhat surprised, asks if Jin Yuk is aware of it. Jin Hyuk explains that he sensed fluctuations in Vulcan's manner, leading him to ask about the encounter. He wonders if Vulcan had met one of the four royalties. Vulcan admits that he encountered a powerful dragon and used his spirit power to immobilize it. Suddenly, Jin Hyuk begins to emanate a menacing dark purple aura and exclaims, One of the four royalties is here. Nervous, Vulcan urges him to calm down cautioning against emitting such demonic energy in the middle of the street. Jin Hyuk notices a drop of blood and wonders if it's a side effect of his gluttony skill. Vulcan reiterates the need to calm down and informs Jin Hyuk that the dragon he encountered was no ordinary one. Jin Hyuk queries what Vulcan means by that and Vulcan proceeds to recount the entire story. Jin Hyuk, deep in thought, puts his finger to his chin and mentions, the dragon slayer, Hendrik, huh? Vulcan adds that what the dragon told him does make sense. Jin Hyuk ponders the idea of one's body and soul acting independently. Vulcan points out that he initially had doubts but witnessed an example in Jin Hyuk himself. Jin Hyuk exclaims, Hendrik, the dragon slayer, and notes that even he knows that name. He explains that Hendrik began his journey by slaying young dragons and eventually took on other dragons that came after him, earning him the title of dragon slayer. Jin Yuk had heard that Hendrik met his end on the 700th or 800th floor. Vulcan suggests that Jin Hyuk might be walking into a trap set by the four royalties. With a smirk, Jin Hyuk expresses his intention to meet Hendrik, but he suddenly starts coughing. Vulcan reprimands him for going overboard, explaining that his gluttony trait is broken and there's a penalty for consuming things. After ingesting the poison, fire and frost stones, it's imperative for Jin Yuk to swiftly seek treatment for the internal injuries they've inflicted. Jin Yuk questions, treatment? By a priest? Are you out of your mind? He inquires of Vulcan if he's willing to undergo purification via divine power, along with the aid of spirit soldiers. Vulcan, in response, queries what Jin Yuk intends to do, and insinuates that continuing without treatment might result in dire consequences even jesting about the possibility of Jin Hyuk bleeding uncontrollably. Jin Hyuk realizes that obtaining divine power might be the most prudent course of action. Vulcan dismisses this idea as ludicrous. Suddenly, Jin Hyuk notices Miho growling at someone nearby and asks her what's causing the sudden agitation. He wonders why she's behaving in such an unusual manner, then attempts to silence her when he experiences discomfort in his ear. Abruptly, Vulcan addresses Jin Yuk, expressing concern about the peculiar behavior of the people around them, who seem to be moving mindlessly, unresponsive to Miho's howls. Jin Yuk admits he's uncertain about the reason, but observes the people walking in an eerie synchrony. 
Unexpectedly, a golden circle materializes above Jin Hyuk and Vulcan, causing their eyes to widen. They turn around to find a woman with a halo above her head approaching them. She greets them with, Nice to meet you, Ghostface. Jin Hyuk is taken aback and inwardly exclaims, An angel! Without wasting a moment, Jin Hyuk returns the greeting while preparing to strike. But in the blink of an eye, the angel stands in front of him, sword in hand, warning him not to take actions he'll regret. Shocked, Jin Hyuk acknowledges her swiftness. With a smirk, the angel offers her greetings once more, saying, Nice to meet you, Ghostface. As Jin Hyuk attempts to move his sword, he can't help but acknowledge the angel's incredible strength. She firmly holds his sword, and his efforts to wrest it from her grasp prove futile. The angel proceeds to inform him that his mouth is in a terrible state, and his throat, stomach and intestines are all seriously damaged. Feeling her touch, he questions her actions. Suddenly the angel begins to emit a radiant glow. As she steps back, Vulcan inquires about Jin Hyuk's well-being. Inwardly, Jin Hyuk notes that his previously damaged body now feels completely healed. He gazes at the angel and recognizes this extraordinary power as divine power. The angel then inquires if Jin Hyuk can accept that she's not his enemy after what she has done. Introducing herself as Uriel, she reveals her affiliation with Wingless. A few moments later, a commotion is heard, and the NPCs regain consciousness, bewildered about their recent actions. The scene transitions to the Gold Rich Hotel. Guys, the translators decided to change Gold Lich to Gold Rich, so we calling it that from now. Within the hotel, the maids found themselves in a dazed state, contemplating whether they'd overexerted themselves lately. Unbeknownst to them, Jin Hyuk watched from the shadows. In the hotel room, Jin Hyuk confronted the angel, questioning her intentions. She openly admitted to having subtly adjusted the memories of the NPCs, a precaution taken to protect the local citizens. Rushing rumors of her presence and causing an influx of angels heading to the tenth floor would have been detrimental. Jin Hyuk privately mused that her methods might be excessive, but not entirely reckless. Memory alteration, huh? Not a bad idea, he remarked. Concerned that she might use this on him, Jin Hyuk sought reassurance. She explained that it was impossible to manipulate the memories of individuals with a strong sense of self like himself. Uriel then brought up Miho and Vulcan, prompting Vulcan to acknowledge her ability to perceive him. Jin Hyuk questioned why she had sought him out, and she enigmatically spoke of the one who wears the mask condensing grotesqueness and defying the heavens. She prophesied that despite their weaknesses, Jin Hyuk and his followers would ultimately succeed. Speculating that her visit was related to a prophecy within Wingless, Jin Hyuk inquired if it was a divine revelation. Her response was, it's similar. Inwardly, Jin Hyuk surmised that the one who wears the mask condenses grotesqueness was likely referring to him. He then asked about the group Wingless since it was his first encounter with them. Suddenly, Uriel removed her coat, revealing her back and the absence of wings, a shocking sight. She explained the dire state of the angels, driven to madness by greed. Those who defied them were branded as sinners and cast out, subjected to the punishment of having their wings, a symbol of angels, torn away. In short, they were angels no more. Uriel revealed that Wingless was a collective of angels like herself, all once part of Utopia, the City of Angels. According to the prophecy, Jin Hyuk would disrupt the reign of the Four Royalties, and Wingless sought to join forces in this endeavor. Jin Hyuk let out a sigh and began telepathically conversing with Vulcan, seeking his guidance. Vulcan inquired what he meant, because he didn't believe Uriel was lying, advising Jin Hyuk to simply say yes. So Jin Hyuk asked Uriel about the assistance the Wingless could provide. To his astonishment, she responded with nothing, leaving him taken aback. She explained that although the power of the Wingless was immense, it had marked them as enemies in Utopia's eyes, resulting in close surveillance and support coupled with angelic hostility. Inwardly, Jin Hyuk mused, a stalemate, huh? He recognized the dilemma of declining an army of former angels as a waste, 
while accepting it posed a significant risk. Nonetheless, he conveyed his willingness to bear that risk and asked if Uriel would assist if he needed to employ the wingless's power. With a resolute expression, she replied, Gladly. Jinyuk expressed his satisfaction, stating that their alliance was now confirmed. Uriel, still addressing him as Ghostface, bowed in gratitude. Jinhyuk considered introducing himself and inquired if she could momentarily blind both God and the Devil. She confirmed she could, and used a feather from her wings to seal the room, isolating them from the outside world. Jin Hyuk recognized that her power shared a principle with Gold Rich's abilities and questioned whether those bastards could hear them. She assured him they couldn't, even if he cursed at them. Jin Hyuk removed his mask and hurled curses at Baal, referring to him as a voyeuristic sick bastard and demanding if he was listening. Uriel was visibly shocked by his words. When Baal didn't respond, Jin Hyuk acknowledged the legitimacy of Uriel's power. He explained that he needed this private space due to their shared predicament and asked if using a false name and a mask was unnecessary. He introduced himself as Cha Jin Hyuk, the same Death Star from ten years ago. Uriel was flabbergasted and repeated his name, falling to her knees in worry. She apologized for her incompetence and Jin Hyuk inquired if she knew the chaotic Jin Hyuk who had died a decade ago. Uriel revealed that she had been present when Jin Hyuk's death was discussed ten years ago. This revelation caused Jin Hyuk's mood to shift to one of anger. Jin Hyuk loomed menacingly, casting a baleful gaze upon Uriel. With a resounding stomp that sent tremors through the floor and a foreboding aura enveloping him, Jin Hyuk warned her to choose her words wisely. Uriel then inquired if he knows about the consequences of reaching the 999th floor of the tower. Still wearing an enraged expression, Jin Hyuk responded, suggesting that one might become a voyeuristic transcendent, akin to a deity or demon, overseeing the tower's affairs. Uriel referred to these beings as the angels, but she paused and amended her statement, noting that the four royalties had been consumed by their arrogance attempting to monopolize their positions and eliminating those who sought to conquer the tower, except themselves. In bewilderment, Jin Hyuk mumbled, Select and kill. Uriel asked if he knew about it. Jin Hyuk, now convinced that the mastermind was before him, furiously threatened to deliver her head to where his wings resided. He seized her by the neck with shadowy hands, prompting her to explain that she became wingless a decade ago for opposing the select and kill order on a particular climber whose name was Death Star Cha Jin Hyuk. Upon hearing this revelation, Jin Hyuk released his grip, awkwardly acknowledging his improper behavior and offering an apology. Uriel assured him that it was all right and accepted the burden of her actions. Jin Hyuk, understanding the distinction between the wingless and the angels, refrained from venting his anger on her. Uriel expressed her gratitude for his understanding and suggested that, like them, there might be other victims of the Four Royalties, encouraging Jin Hyuk to welcome them if they approached. Jin Hyuk agreed, realizing their potential allies in the war against the Four Royalties. He then inquired about where to meet her again, and she directed him to the wingless hideout on the 190th floor of Dream City. Jin Hyuk remarked, that the 190th floor seemed significantly lower than he had expected. Uriel explained that the higher the floor, the more influence the four royalties held, and the floors from 200 to 300 were under his territory. Jin Hyuk realized that he had almost forgotten that this territory was under the reign of the Martial Emperor Tess, who ruled over the floors from 200 to 300. Setting up their base within his territory, meant a higher chance of the four royalties meeting their destruction. When Uriel asked if she could get dressed, Jin Yuk agreed, saying, Of course. As she prepared to put on her coat, he couldn't help but notice her feathers. He inquired if there would be a trace if she gave him something, and she explained that due to the pursuit of the angels, she could only bring herself. With a creepy grin, Jin Yuk assured her that it was enough. Uriel, however, looked at him with disdain, asking, You were that type of person? 
Panicking, Jin Yuk clarified that he didn't mean that and only wanted some of her feathers. Uriel sighed with relief and mentioned that if it's that, she can give him some, because her feathers grow back as she removed some for him. Jin Yuk inwardly acknowledged his relief, thinking he'd asked carefully because he believed they didn't grow back. After giving him some of her feathers, she cautioned him not to show the feathers outside, as angels had a skill for locating the feathers' owner. Jin Hyuk assured her he planned to consume them. Her mood shifted, and she teased, So you were that type of person? Jin Hyuk insisted he wasn't that type, and she trusted him, telling him to get going and that she'd see him next time in Dream City. Jin Hyuk agreed, promising to meet her expectations. She said she'd look forward to it, and then disappeared. Jin Hyuk sat down, and Vulcan asked if he was going to eat the wing now. Jin Yuk, filled with excitement, confirmed this and wondered if he could endure the angel's divine power and what abilities he might gain. Vulcan, resigned since the third poison, told him to do as he pleased. He then told Miho to not eat anything she found, much like Jin Yuk. Jin Yuk proceeded to eat the wing, but something unexpected happened. His entire body began to emanate a golden aura as he screamed in pain. Vulcan, accustomed to these bizarre situations, simply shrugged and went on to give Miho an airplane ride while Jinyuk struggled to breathe. Jinyuk's screams of pain echoed in the background, but Vulcan paid little attention. Suddenly, Jinyuk found himself waking up in the mind realm. Confused, he asked himself if he had fainted, realizing that he was now in this unusual place. He contemplated whether his body had decided that consuming divine power was too much, meaning he had to win here. As he got to his feet, Jin Yuk turned around and was met with the sight of an enormous glistening golden waterfall. That waterfall embodied the divine power surging within him, resembling a colossal mountain. Jin Yuk silently expressed relief that he didn't have to engage in a battle with Uriel. Even if he had emerged victorious and devoured her essence, the thought was too unsettling to dwell upon. Suddenly the water began to surge, and it dawned on him that the waterfall was more than just a mere illusion. He needed to break through this cascade of divine power before it seized control of his mental realm. He pondered his options and with a sly grin he mused, Well, there's only one way, isn't there? Back in the tangible world, Vulcan's attention shifted to Jin Hyuk, observing that he was employing spirit power, but there was something distinct this time. Jin Hyuk was utilizing his own soul as the substance for this spirit power. Miho appeared concerned, yet Vulcan reassured her, expressing faith in Jin Hyuk because his actions indicated he had a plan. Vulcan eagerly anticipated what surprises Jin Hyuk had in store. Returning to Jin Hyuk's struggle, he was witness sucking the divine power through a conduit. After a few moments, he admitted, this isn't it either. To encapsulate his spirit power imbued with divine essence, he reasoned that crafting an image of himself consuming it, given that he had acquired the power through gluttony, would be the right approach. However, he felt that failure was looming if he continued down this path. If the divine power overwhelmed him, he'd either lose consciousness permanently or have to relinquish this newfound power. Nonetheless, with unwavering determination, he questioned himself, calming his nerves by acknowledging that it was a creation of his own soul. Suddenly, a shadowy figure began to materialize, and a massive shadowy monster materialized beside Jin Hyuk. Sporting a devious grin, Jin Hyuk declared, Now this is the real deal. He proceeded to manipulate the monstrous entity which began to consume the golden divine power bit by bit. Jin Hyuk maintained his menacing smirk, repeatedly chanting, More, 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 as his shadowy creation voraciously devoured the divine power. Back in the real world, Jin Hyuk was seen smirking, and near him, Baal wore a satisfied smile. Bale began to clap with excitement, noting that Jin Hyuk's actions seemed to mirror his own. He welcomed the emergence of the Demon King of Gluttony. In a brief flashback, Jin Hyuk had mentioned the Greedy Dragon, and the Gold Rich had identified this entity as Baal. To them, Baal was a neutral deity with a penchant for scheming. 
True to his name, he possessed an insatiable greed, indulging in various species and desiring even more. He's an insatiable dragon with an appetite for everything in this world, aptly named the Greedy Dragon. Gold Rich had just started explaining the enigmatic history of this greedy dragon when the flashback abruptly ceased, bringing us back to the present where Jin Hyuk harnessed his greed and completely consumed the divine power. In the tangible world, Vulcan roused Jin Hyuk from his trance, and Miho, elated to see him awake, eagerly embraced him with a hug. Jin Hyuk assured her he was back. Vulcan couldn't resist asking if Jin Hyuk had succeeded or failed, ready to poke fun if it were the latter. With a smirk, Jin Hyuk dismissed Vulcan's hopes of mockery, affirming his success as he exhibited his newfound divine energy merged with the dark power. Jin Hyuk explained that despite its current small size, he had developed an organ capable of generating divine power. He turned to Vulcan for his opinion, asking if he was content with this result. Vulcan privately marveled at the extraordinary outcome, but also recognized the lurking danger. Jin Yuk, not yet strong enough to withstand a coordinated assault from the four royalties, was vulnerable. In his current incomplete state, facing off against the four royalties could prove fatal. A few days later, on the 10th floor hunting ground, Jin Yuk's spirit soldiers were busy dispatching numerous orcs. Suddenly, they encountered an unusual-looking orc that managed to take down one of the spirits. Jin Hyuk and Vulcan watched from above, and Jin Hyuk uttered, It has begun, with a growing pile of orc corpses behind him. The orc skillfully cleaved through the spirit soldiers, leaving them bisected on the ground. A sudden radiant glow emanated from the wounds, leaving the orc in awe. The source of the golden light was a celestial spirit soldier. Jin Hyuk turned to Vulcan and inquired about his experience with the new Holy Spirit soldier. Vulcan shared that it performed as expected, serving as the exclusive healer for both the undead and spirit soldiers. It completely nullified the typical necromancer's drawback of resource wastage due to weak endurance during summoning. Nevertheless, given its divine nature, it had a propensity for seeking enlightenment. Jin Hyuk commented on the situation noting that they could only be cautious in dealing with it. Meanwhile, Miho indulged in consuming the orcs. Vulcan remarked that it seemed like she had finished her meal. Jin Hyuk inquired whether it was enjoyable. Observing the quest notification displaying that Miho had devoured 892 raw livers out of 999, Jin Hyuk contemplated how he had unexpectedly earned the Orc Slayer title for the second time. He then opened his status window, revealing his traits, stats, name, skills, subclass, class and physical condition. Inwardly, he acknowledged that his divine power had grown over the past few days, increasing by two, although with a base value of three, it might not be exceptionally helpful. However, he could resort to it in emergencies. Vulcan asked Jin Hyuk what they should do next. Jin Hyuk responded that they should proceed to meet Hendrik. Upon returning to the city, Jin Yuk inquired with Vulcan about the accuracy of the information. Vulcan affirmed that Hendrik was indeed not ascending the tower, seemingly waiting for someone. Inwardly, Jin Yuk deduced that Hendrik, a dragon slayer inhabiting a dragon's body, piqued his interest. If Hendrik remained stuck on the tenth floor, there had to be a significant reason. Just like Uriel, Hendrik might be anticipating something after listening a revelation from the gods and demons. Vulcan informed Jin Hyuk that they had arrived, and once they left the alley they would encounter Hendrik. Jin Hyuk stepped out of the alley and found himself surrounded by a multitude of people. Upon closer inspection, he spotted a man with horns and red eyes, enveloped in a crimson aura. Considering their approach, Jin Hyuk asked Vulcan if they should approach Hendrik directly. Vulcan cautious of the situation, inquired whether Jin Hyuk was willing to engage with Hendrik, as he might not be the person Hendrik was expecting, potentially leading to a deadly confrontation. Jin Hyuk, sporting a mischievous grin, proposed settling the matter through combat. Vulcan responded, dubbing Jin Hyuk insane and suggesting that he go on ahead without him. Jin Hyuk taunted Vulcan, 
stating that he knew Vulcan was fearful due to a past encounter where he got quite battered in a fight with Hendrik. Vulcan retorted, Scared? Who got battered? Defending his pride as the first spirit master, Vulcan asserted he'd never run away. Jin Hyuk, however, urged him not to lie, mentioning how he had fled, looking worse for wear. Hendrik suddenly closed his eyes, and they were transported into a flashback, where he was told that the one who could fulfill his wish would appear on the tenth floor and ask to wait. Returning to the present, Vulcan and Jin Hyuk faced Hendrik. Jin Hyuk asked if he was Hendrik, to which Hendrik replied in the affirmative, adding that he had been wondering when Jin Hyuk would approach him. Hendrik then recognized Vulcan as a familiar face, causing Vulcan to tremble. Hendrik abruptly declared that Jin Hyuk had passed, prompting Jin Hyuk to express his displeasure with Hendrik's initial judgment, though he chose to let it slide since Hendrik said that he passed. Hendrik noted the prying eyes around them and requested that Jin Hyuk follow him. They reached what seemed like a dead-end alley, leaving Jin Hyuk puzzled about why they had ventured so far. Jin Hyuk pointed out the many alleys in the square. Suddenly, Hendrik placed his hand on the wall and a portal materialized. He entered it and Jin Hyuk informed Vulcan that they would follow Hendrik, stepping through the portal. Inside, Jin Hyuk questioned Hendrik about their location, to which Hendrik explained it was a subspace, a hidden space on the tenth floor where the eyes of the gods and demons held no power. Jin Hyuk contemplated that he could unmistakably sense that something had weakened. Hendrik posed a question, expressing his intention to exterminate all the dragons who had slain him within the tower. He asked Jin Yuk if he was prepared to join him in achieving this goal. Jin Yuk responded with a smirk, remarking that Hendrik's ambition seemed rather petty for a man of his stature. Incensed, Hendrik demanded clarification about what Jin Yuk meant by petty. Vulcan intervened, privately informing Jin Hyuk that Hendrik was a formidable monster on a different level and questioned why he was provoking him. Jin Hyuk telepathically labelled Vulcan a loser and assured him that he had a plan in mind. Addressing Hendrik, Jin Hyuk acknowledged that he might not fully understand Hendrik's situation, but he could grasp how Hendrik had become the way he was. Jin Hyuk expressed his certainty that Hendrik was aware that the culprits who had wronged them weren't limited to the four royalties. Jin Hyuk stated that he didn't care why Hendrik had become fixated on dragons, but declared it insufficient for him to form an alliance. He proclaimed his intention to exact vengeance on all those who had wronged him, irrespective of whether they were the four royalties or anyone else. In essence, Hendrik's goals was too little for Jin Hyuk to ally with him. Hendrik, in response, inquired if Jin Hyuk genuinely planned to confront the four royalties. Congratulations on reaching this point. If you've managed to make it this far, please leave a comment saying Necromancer to confuse those who skipped this section or failed to watch the entire video. Jin Hyuk asserts that they both embody a state of death yet alive, attributing those malevolent individuals as the culprits responsible for his demise. Abruptly, Hendrik begins to chuckle, eventually erupting into laughter, leaving Jin Hyuk and Vulcan to observe him in silence. Subsequently, Hendrik extends his apologies, affirming Jin Hyuk's correctness. A sudden transformation in Hendrik's demeanor transpires, marked by an earnest expression as he proclaims Jin Hyuk as the prophesied individual spoken of by Uriel. This declaration leaves Jin Hyuk startled, concealing his internal wonderment concerning whether wingless beings have already approached Hendrik. Hendrik proceeds to unsheathe his sword while expressing his anticipation for an impending confrontation. He articulates his intent to personally assess and scrutinize Jin Yuk's commitment, questioning whether it is genuine or a mere charade, dubbing Jin Hyuk as the one who conspires against the divine will. Subsequently, Hendrik inquires about Jin Yuk's identity. In response, Jin Hyuk unveils his countenance by removing his mask, introducing himself as Cha Jin Yuk, bearing the epithet, the Death Star. Suddenly, an elderly gentleman exclaims, labeling Hendrik as a troublesome figure for revisiting this place. He questions whether Hendrik has yet to accomplish his initial purpose. Jin Yuk 
perplexed, inquires about the identity of the elderly man. Hendrik reveals him as the local blacksmith and the creator of his sword. The blacksmith confirms his role and chastises Hendrik for his return, given that he has already acquired the sword. He inquires about the reason for Hendrik's reappearance. Upon a closer examination, Jin Hyuk discerns the old men as an oni. The oni observes the peculiar amalgamation of a spirit and a mythical being following under a human, and inquires about Jin Hyuk's identity. Jin Hyuk inquired of the elderly gentleman how he had managed to survive, to which the old man, somewhat displeased, branded Jin Hyuk as a disrespectful scoundrel lacking reverence for his elders. He brusquely challenged Jin Hyuk to air any grievances he might have. Jin Hyuk clarified his intent, seeking to know how the old man had endured that calamity. Suddenly the Oni's countenance shifted to one of gravity, and he poised himself to strike Jin Hyuk with his mallet, convinced that Jin Hyuk was the arsonist responsible for his village's devastation. However, Hendrik intervened, restraining the Oni's hand. The Oni, tears glistening in his eyes, implored Hendrik to release him, asserting that Jin Hyuk had set his village ablaze. Hendrik reassured him, urging him to calm down and explaining that Jin Hyuk shared a similar background. Vulcan, curious, inquired if the Oni was acquainted with an Oni named Haryu. The Oni, taken aback, questioned how Vulcan knew Haryu. Back at the elderly man's location, Jin Hyuk quietly recounted his encounter with Haryu, prompting a sense of relief in the Oni upon hearing that Haryu was alive. Hendrik, standing nearby, pondered internally how surprising it was that such a fortuitous coincidence had unfolded. The Oni recounted that that day marked the commencement of their village's traditional festival. Every Oni had ascended to the 100th floor, but due to his advanced age and illness, he had stayed behind. Tragically, that very night, his village was reduced to ashes. Anxiously, the Oni inquired about Haryu's safety. Jin Hyuk reassured him, disclosing that Haryu was currently on the ninth floor, and they would soon reunite with her. The Oni then noticed the mask in Jin Hyuk's possession, and inquired if it belonged to Haryu. Jin Hyuk confirmed it, explaining that Haryu had regarded it as her way of repaying him for saving her. Hendrik, curious about Haryu's strength, asked Jin Hyuk, who affirmed her prowess, and added that she was still growing, likely surpassing them in one-on-one -on -one battles. Hendrik inquired about Haryu's status in Jin Hyuk's party, wondering if she was a temporary or permanent member. Jin Hyuk explained that he had embraced Haryu's mask and committed to seeking vengeance alongside her. Geno, the only blacksmith, gratefully grasped Jin Hyuk's hand and introduced himself. He pledged to do everything within his power to support Jin Hyuk and implored them to rebuild the village with Haryu. Jin Hyuk, slightly taken aback, responded, Pardon? Ah, well, we should. Observing the scene, Vulcan mused internally about whether Jin Hyuk comprehended that accepting the mask was equivalent to accepting Haryu's proposal. Geno generously offered all the weapons in his workshop. After inspecting the swords, Jin Hyuk noted their exceptional quality, surpassing those received from Gold Rich. Hendrik clarified that Geno was the finest Oni blacksmith, explaining the exceptional craftsmanship. Following this exchange, they decided to depart, but found Geno peacefully asleep. Hendrik remarked that Geno appeared to have finally relaxed upon learning of a survivor from his village, a rarity in his experience. Jin Yuk suggested they leave Geno to rest, and expressed his intention to bring Haryu to meet him. As he observed the elderly man, Jin Hyuk inwardly anticipated that Haryu would gain strength from this meeting and felt pleased. Suddenly Vulcan urgently called Jin Hyuk and warned him to be cautious. With swift reflexes, Jin Hyuk evaded an attack from Hendrik. In response, he questioned Hendrik's motives. Hendrik reminded him about their previous discussion, emphasizing that he had mentioned testing Jin Hyuk. Grinning, he warned that if Jin Hyuk wasn't skilled enough to survive, he should abandon any notion of challenging the will of the gods. Jin Hyuk retorted, insisting that he would test Hendrik as well. Just as their conversation unfolded, nearby buildings began to crumble, 
marking the onset of a fierce battle between Jin Hyuk and Hendrik. As Jin Hyuk dispatched his spectral warriors toward Hendrik, the latter swiftly drew his blade and cleaved those ethereal entities into countless fragments. Out of thin air, floating blades converged around Hendrik, poised to pierce him. But he thwarted their attempt by swinging his sword, recognizing it as shallow tricks. Unexpectedly, Jin Hyuk materialized above Hendrik and launched an offensive with his blade, yet Hendrik adeptly evaded the strike. With a deft maneuver, Hendrik gripped Jin Hyuk's hand and flung him onto a nearby house, leaving Miho anxious. Hendrik acknowledged Jin Hyuk's title as a mage and necromancer, acknowledging his remarkable dexterity, but cautioned that this trait could lead to a problem. Suddenly, Vulcan materialized behind Hendrik and ensnared him with his chains, questioning him about what he thinks about the first spirit master. Jin Yuk then unleashed a potent magic technique called Gungnir, astonishing Hendrik as he claimed it to be his mightiest. Grinning, Jin Yuk exclaimed, Chaya, and launched arrows toward Hendrik. In response, Hendrik's sword reacted, forming intricate patterns which Vulcan recognized. Hendrik employed a skill known as Enchant Dispel Magic, severing the chains that bound him. Seeing this, Vulcan urgently instructed Jin Yuk to dodge. Hendrik unleashed another skill, shattering Dragon Slash, intercepting and obliterating the arrow before advancing toward Jin Yuk. The ensuing impact caused a massive explosion. Vulcan, with concern in his voice, called out to Jin Yuk. Hendrik struck Vulcan with his sword, noting that Vulcan was Jin Yuk's most potent soldier, leaving him with nothing more to say as he closed in on Jin Yuk, proclaiming his impending defeat. Jin Hyuk then appeared on the side of the house, calmly stating, Nope. Holding a bow, he declared himself as the strongest one remaining. Jin Hyuk aimed and shot a volley of small arrows toward Hendrik, but he completely missed him, prompting a retort from Hendrik about the stark contrast between Jin Hyuk's swordsmanship and his archery skills, describing the latter as atrocious. However, the arrows took an unexpected turn, glowing with magic, and returned to pierce Hendrik causing him to descend. Inwardly, Jin Yuk celebrated a critical hit and resolved to go all out to finish Hendrik, donning his Oni mask. He mentioned that he had only previously brought out the side effects when using the mask with Haryu, but now he intended to succeed. As he put on the mask, he harnessed his battle foresight. Falling, Hendrik's anger intensified, conjuring a colossal fire tornado at his location. Jin Hyuk regretfully noted that he had missed his chance and that Hendrik was not an easy foe to vanquish. Hendrik, now with a transformed countenance, laughed and acknowledged Jin Hyuk's strength, asserting that he had lost in terms of numbers. He declared that the fight wasn't over, craving more. Hendrik unleashed his skill, charging Dragon Spark, urging Jin Hyuk to continue the battle. Jin Hyuk was left in disbelief internally grappling with the realization that there seemed to be no way out. He could track Hendrik's attacks with his battle foresight, but he lacked the speed to evade them, and getting hit would prove fatal. With no alternative, Jin Hyuk retrieved his fox mask, donning it and expressing his trust in it. He looked rather impressive with his new mask. The elderly man's eyes snapped open, his shock palpable as he beheld the havoc wrought by Jin Hyuk and Hendrik. He bellowed, demanding to know what was happening, suspecting Hendrik's hand in it. In an instant, Miho sprang from her slumber and fled the house, leaving Garon in pursuit, shouting to her about the danger. As Miho gazed at a colossal beam of light, her apprehension was etched across her face. The source of the radiance was none other than Hendrik, as he readied an attack known as the Charging Dragon Spark. He abruptly vanished leaving Jin Hyuk bewildered by his sudden disappearance. Out of nowhere, Hendrik reappeared before Jin Hyuk, his sword perilously close to his face. A colossal explosion ensued, and when the dust cleared, it was evident that Jin Hyuk had evaded Hendrik's assault. After the debris cleared, Hendrik was astounded to realize that Jin Hyuk had miraculously evaded his devastating attack, causing him to secretly concede that this wasn't an assault that Jin Hyuk's agility alone could evade. With a serene poise, Jin Hyuk materialized behind Hendrik, 
untouched by the confrontation. This left Hendrik pondering whether the enigmatic mask adorning Jin Hyuk belonged to that mystical fox. Hendrik couldn't help but chuckle, questioning Jin Hyuk's motives as he prepared to retaliate. Jin Hyuk, however, equipped weapons similar to Wolverine's and lunged at Hendrik, their blades clashing in a tense showdown. Countless clashes ensued between them, their weapons clashing and sparking in a flurry of combat. Abruptly, Hendrik burst into laughter, complimenting Jin Yuk's enhanced mobility and newfound strength. Pondering aloud whether the mystical fox mask was the source of this transformation. In response, Jin Yuk maintained an unwavering silence, his eyes carefully scanning for an opportunity. Seizing a perceived weakness, he lunged forward to strike, but soon realized that Hendrik had deliberately created this opening to deploy his magic. Hendrik's sorcery triggered a powerful explosion where Jin Yuk had stood moments ago. Astonishingly, Jin Yuk emerged from the settling dust unscathed, poised in a defensive stance. With an intense gaze, he attempted to employ the charm skill on Hendrik. However, Hendrik swiftly shattered the charm and quipped, I don't swing that way. A chuckle followed, with Hendrik explaining that such spells could be easily broken with a bit of focus. Suddenly, Jin Hyuk materialized in front of Hendrik, retorting, but you'd have to stop moving for a moment. Internally, Jin Hyuk resolved not to employ a weak weapon and decided to conclude the confrontation with a decisive attack. He announced his intention to employ the Gung Hoon skill, combining it with all Master Martial Combat, Fox's mobility, and various enchantments, such as enhanced physical strength, spirit power, demonic energy, and divine power. As he readied a punch, he informed Hendrik that this would be the end, concluding with a taunting remark and unleashing the Choi Gung Hoon technique, the straight jab. With a mighty shove, Jin Yuk propelled Hendrik, unleashing a cataclysmic explosion that laid waste to numerous buildings. Amid the debris, Vulcan struggled to regain his footing, questioning whether he had lost consciousness and pondering the outcome of the battle between Jin Yuk and Hendrik. His attention was abruptly drawn to Cha Jin Yuk, standing as if he had emerged victorious. Blood trickled from Jin Yuk's eyes and mouth as he began to stagger, prompting Vulcan to call out his name with deep concern. Internally, Jin Yuk acknowledged that he had expended all his strength, rendering his body immobile. He regretted not finishing Hendrik with his last attack, especially since Hendrik remained standing before him far from defeated. Hendrik, visibly battered and fatigued, informed Jin Yuk that he had passed. However, Jin Yuk's irritation flared, and he rebuked Hendrik, asserting that he had failed. He emphasized that deploying a final move should render one incapacitated, all while dubbing Hendrik a monster. Hendrik, seemingly perturbed, raised a contemplative finger to his chin, expressing annoyance while saying, to think that Jin Hyuk would fail him while looking like that. Abruptly, Hendrik relented with a begrudging fine, announcing his intent to determine Jin Hyuk's fate after unleashing his ultimate assault. He reasoned that he had taken a liking to Jin Hyuk, so he needed to pass no matter what. Jin Hyuk, however, implored him to hold off, as his body refused to respond, yet Hendrik remained undeterred, preparing to execute his flower dragon attack. As the formidable assault closed in on Jin Yuk, he acquiesced with a resigned fine you pass, and in his last breath he hurled an expletive at Hendrik, branding him a fucking bastard, just as the attack made its devastating impact. The scene shifts to a comical exchange between Jin Hyuk and Vulcan inside the elderly gentleman's abode. Vulcan teased Jin Hyuk for his loss, but Jin Hyuk retorted, claiming that Vulcan had lost as well. Vulcan reminded Jin Hyuk of the promise he made to Hendrik about testing him. Jin Hyuk, wrapped in bandages, grew increasingly irritated with Vulcan and threatened to turn him into a spirit orb. However, his attempt was met with excruciating pain, causing him to halt, and Vulcan couldn't help but giggle, remarking, Serves you right. Sporting a broad grin, Vulcan pointed out that he had cautioned Jin Yuk not to go overboard emphasizing that Jin Yuk owed his continued existence to meeting Uriel and attaining divine power. Jin Hyuk playfully referred to Vulcan as an old man, 
further infuriating him. Jin Hyuk, clearly irked, challenged Vulcan to wait and see what would happen once he recovered, all while Vulcan continues to chuckle and dismiss Jin Hyuk's frustration as the cries of a loser. Suddenly Hendrik swung open the door and entered the room, inquiring about Jin Hyuk's well-being. Vulcan began to sweat profusely, recalling Hendrik's previous threat to slice him to pieces. Awkwardly, Vulcan offered an apology for his earlier actions. Hendrik responded with a smirk, reassuring Vulcan that it was all right since they were all in the same boat now. Vulcan, visibly relieved, stammered out his gratitude and inwardly noted the stark contrast between Hendrik's demeanour in a fight against Jinyuk and his normal composed self. Vulcan then expressed remorse for the trouble Hendrik had gone through to check on Jinyuk. Hendrik inquired if he had gone a little overboard. Jinyuk, still reeling from being Lil Brode, exploded, challenging both of them to face him in a fight, convinced he'd win next time. Inwardly, Hendrik acknowledged that Jin Hyuk would indeed be capable of defeating him one day. After taking a deep breath, Jin Hyuk calmed down and revealed the reason he had summoned Hendrik. He wanted to hear Hendrik's story, particularly about his past life and death. Hendrik began by recounting how his family and hometown had vanished mysteriously, courtesy of the dragons. His miraculous survival was attributed to his burning hatred for dragons. He proceeded to climb the tower just like other climbers, but he was fortunate to possess exceptional talent. Jin Hyuk noted the similarity between Hendrik's history and that of someone else he knew. Hendrik divulged that he had slain his first dragon on the 600th floor and subsequently embarked on a journey of revenge. Jin Hyuk remarked on the quick progress to the 600th floor, wondering if Hendrik then went on to confront the four royalties. Hendrik confirmed this, but mentioned that it also marked the commencement of a pursuit by a team dispatched by the four royalties. This pursuit became his daily routine, and as he grew stronger, the penalty lessened. He revealed that their branch on the 800th floor had essentially been wiped out. Inwardly, Jinyuk explained that the penalty system was designed to prevent high-level climbers from monopolizing the tower imposing restrictions on their abilities on lower floors, rather than the higher ones they'd reached. This was why he'd survived Gold Rich's attack. If there wasn't a penalty, he would have died from one attack. He asked Hendrik about the highest floor he'd reached, and Hendrik replied, 900th floor. It was on that floor that his plan ultimately met its demise. Jinyuk realized that Hendrik could have become a transcendent, Hendrik continued his tale, explaining that a more formidable pursuit team under the four royalties had been dispatched to capture him, and he eventually succumbed to their numbers. He became like this, he said. Hendrik found it ironic that among the myriad species he had reincarnated into the body of a dragon. He desired death but couldn't easily achieve it in such a powerful form, so he accepted it, vowing to use this body as a tool for his revenge. Jin Yuk replied with a smirk, Yeah, that sounds like you. Hendrik, eager to get started, asked when they should begin climbing. However, he suddenly recalled that Jin Hyuk had mentioned waiting for Haru. Jin Hyuk, looking puzzled, inquired whether Hendrik intended to join them in climbing the tower. With a playful grin, Hendrik quipped, Where would I go after leaving you weakling? Making Jin Hyuk more pissed off. Hendrik then asserted that he and Jin Hyuk were remarkably similar, because they both had faced their last moments alone in their previous lives, marred by failure. They needed to learn from these experiences, and it would be foolish to believe they could face their challenges alone. Jin Hyuk nodded in agreement, recognizing the need for a friend and ally, someone from their bloodline to stand by their side. Hendrik then made a surprising proposition— suggesting that Jin Hyuk should create a guild. Jin Hyuk, taken aback, stammered, A uh, guild? Meanwhile, in the guildhouse on the 600th floor's holy kingdom, a woman expressed her frustration and inquired about the commotion. She opened the door and turned to Kane, asking him what was happening. Kane gazed at the flames that Jin Hyuk had ignited on the 10th floor and casually diverted her attention. 
mentioning an intriguing report from the White Swallow branch on the tenth floor. He explained that the branch had been reduced to rubble by a single individual, leaving her in shock. Kane elaborated, noting that according to Beck Hallio's report, it didn't appear to be the work of an ordinary organization or guild. Her surprise deepened, and she asserted, impossible. She pointed out that even on a lower-level floor like the Tenth, the penalty placed restrictions on one's strength, making it seemingly implausible for someone to accomplish such a feat. Ken snapped his fingers in agreement, adding that even nine starts like them found it impossible to conquer a guild house after receiving the Tenth-floor penalty. This indicated that the person responsible had already acquired immense power, much like them when they first entered the tower. The girl fell silent for a moment, and Kane suggested that it was still a possibility. She inquired about their course of action, if such an individual truly existed. With a sly grin, Kane proposed employing the same method they had used ten years ago, eliminating them all. Kane's plan involved hiring a skilled bounty hunter for the task. In another scene, a blonde girl was depicted defeating a massive snake, casually remarking that she had completed another task for the day. Jin Hyuk was pondering the guild quandary, mentioning his alignment with Hendrik's thoughts but noting a snag. He was currently tangled up in Baal's quest, where before hitting the 100th floor, he needed the entire tower to recognize his name and nickname. Jin Hyuk expressed to Hendrik the need for everyone to know his name before he reached the 100th floor, fretting over tarnishing Hendrik's or the guild's reputation. With a pensive gesture, Hendrik acknowledged Bale's quest and proposed a simple solution. Jin Hyuk should be the guild master. This caught Jin Hyuk off guard. Hendrik clarified that he never aspired to that role, admitting his lack of confidence in holding such a position. He believed Jin Hyuk, a skilled necromancer, would excel in leading the army. Jin Hyuk fell silent, admitting his frustration at being weaker than Hendrik and foreseeing situations where he'd have to give orders to someone stronger. Then, unexpectedly, Hendrik dropped to one knee before Jin Hyuk, stunning him. When Jin Hyuk questioned the gesture, Hendrik, with a resolute face, exclaimed, Will you marry me? Hmm, he definitely said that. Hendrik quietly contemplated Jin Hyuk's response, noting to himself that Jin Hyuk wasn't aware of the profound humiliation from his past life. He vividly remembered the anger and powerlessness he felt when he met his demise. Jin Hyuk then probed Hendrik about whether this pursuit served his goal, to which Hendrik firmly replied, yes. Jin Hyuk, with a grin, relented, fine expressing his commitment to become the guildmaster for their shared quest for vengeance. Hendrik commended Jin Hyuk's choice. Vulcan then inquired about the guild's name. Recollecting Uriel's words about the one who wears the mask condenses grotesqueness and defies the heavens. Jin Hyuk confidently proclaimed their guild's name, the Powerpuff Boys. Haha, just kidding. Jin Hyuk settles on heaven's defiance, because what other phrase is more befitting? Vulcan points out the option to pay the company fee for guild creation, but Jin Yuk reveals he can do it for free by informing Puppet. Heading to the gold-rich branch, Jin Hyuk is welcomed by Halcyon, who regrettably informs him of Puppet's absence. Jin Hyuk, curious, inquires about Halcyon's identity, prompting Halcyon to reintroduce himself as the branch manager of the 10th floor. Bro is such a side character, that our boy already forgot about him. That's tragic. After that, Jin Hyuk encountered Ken nearby and inquired about his presence. Ken chuckled and mentioned he stopped by for the tower's maintenance. Halcyon then expressed how close he'd become with Ken. Nervously, Halcyon asked Jin Hyuk's reason for visiting today. Jin Hyuk revealed his intent to start a guild. Halcyon beamed, stating that if it was Jin Hyuk's guild, everyone would want to join. However, he pointed out Jin Hyuk needed more than two members to establish it. Jin Hyuk listed Hendrik, Miho and Vulcan as prospective guild members and asked if that sufficed. Ken was astonished that the dragon joined the guild. Halcyon inquired if Jin Hyuk had won over Hendrik. Jin Hyuk glanced at Hendrik, stating that his guild member is a celebrity, 
which Hendrik amusingly responded, Celebrity? What's that? I don't think that's a compliment. Jinyuk revealed there were more members and sought Halcyon's assistance once they all gathered. Halcyon affirmed saying Gold Rich had instructed him to support Jinhyuk's requests. Later, Jinhyuk extended invitations to the old man Oni, Puppet, Haryu, and even Goldrich. Goldrich mused, a guild, huh? He's up to something interesting. The scene shifted to Jinhyuk using his potent attack. Ten Finger Edge's soul bullet combined with fission magic on orcs, piercing their bodies entirely. Hendrik asked Jinhyuk if he also received a quest from the Nine-Tailed Fox, which Jinhyuk confirmed, believing he could complete it that day. Miho devoured the orcs, enabling Jinhyuk to finish the quest by collecting 999 livers. Upon completing the quest, a radiant pink light descended upon Miho, intriguing Hendrik, who asked what would transpire after Miho consumed all the livers. Jinyuk admitted he hadn't been informed of the outcome. Subsequently, Miho transformed into an egg, prompting Jinyuk to receive a notification stating the nine-tailed fox would revert to her original form. Amidst the astonishment, Vulcan, with an astonished expression, urged Jinhyuk to look ahead. Turning around, Jinhyuk witnessed a humanoid figure materialize within the pink light. Wait, Miho's original form, he exclaimed, taken aback, as Miho transformed into a floating human girl. However, she suddenly fell, luckily caught by Jinhyuk, prompting concern from Vulcan and Hendrik. Bale remarked on Miho's cuteness. to which the nine-tailed fox asserted it was only logical, as Miho was her child. Jinyuk reassured everyone, gazing at Miho, who uttered, Da! Jinyuk echoed, Da! in response. Then, with an endearing expression, Miho called Jinyuk, Daddy, stunning him and the others. Suddenly, a voice questioned, Daddy! It emanated from Haryu, who looked utterly devastated, demanding why Miho referred to Jinyuk as Daddy. Man, I wouldn't want to be in Bro's position. Miho gestured towards Haryu and inquired about her identity, slipping in the word daddy again. Haryu felt a sting at Miho's use of that term for Jinhyuk. An uneasy Jinhyuk, sensing something amiss, nervously asked the nine-tailed fox what was going on. The fox presented a notification, congratulating Jinhyuk on Miho becoming his pet. Pet? Jinhyuk echoed seeking clarification on whether this was the fox's idea of rewarding favorability. The fox then mentioned placing her daughter in Jinhyuk's care before vanishing. Jinhyuk hurriedly asked her to wait and resolve the situation. Vulcan, in a sarcastic tone, offered Jinhyuk congratulations, while Hendrik wondered if humans now gave birth to foxes. Jinhyuk, feeling perplexed, questioned if they were teasing him. Haryu, overwhelmed, dropped to her knees, her eyes filled with jealousy and confusion. Daughter? If his daughter is that old, when did Jin Hyuk have one? She exclaimed. Despite acknowledging Jin Hyuk's strength and charm, she struggled with the idea of him having a lover. Nevertheless, she expressed a resolve to accept the situation and move forward. She expressed feeling like she mattered to Jin Hyuk, then chuckled and added, That's it. It's okay. I'm... Okay. Noticing Haryu was a female Oni, Hendrik assumed her identity and courteously greeted her. Nice to meet you, he said, introducing himself as Hendrik and mentioning his membership in Jinyuk's party, entrusting himself to her care. Haryu glanced at the man standing before her. In her eyes, Hendrik's image flickered to flames, triggering a flashback of her village engulfed in fire. Oni villagers fled, children cried, and in the distance, a dragon's silhouette loomed, its menacing laughter revealing it as the arsonist. Back in the present, Haryu angrily denounced Hendrik as the village's enemy, lunging towards him with a cry of die, swinging her sword only to be blocked by him. Hendrik urged Jin Hyuk to clarify the situation to Haryu, emphasizing her misunderstanding. However, Jin Hyuk, with a smirk, dismissed the idea claiming that Haryu's anger was directed solely at him, leaving Hendrik to handle the situation on his own. 
Despite warning Jin Hyuk of the potential harm to Haryu, Hendrik was assured she could handle it. Upon hearing Jin Hyuk's declaration, Hendrik responded with a smirk and announced that he would consider this confrontation as the entrance test for Go Against God. He retaliated against Haryu, sending her flying backward. She soared into the forest, crashing into numerous trees and creating a massive cloud of dust. As the dust settled, Haryu charged at Hendrik with her sword, seemingly unharmed. Yet again, Hendrik intercepted her strike. He complimented her spirit, but pointed out that her current effort wouldn't cut it. His counterattack showcased his immense power, leaving Haryu no choice but to acknowledge his strength. She fell to the ground, realizing the huge gap in their abilities. Feeling frustrated that despite her enemy being right in front of her, she lacked the power for revenge. Then, the sword spirit emerged, chuckling as he offered Haryu his power just this once. Promising to grant her the strength to slay a dragon, he explained why he was known as a dragon slayer sword. Accepting the sword's power, Haryu's appearance changed, and she lunged towards Hendrik. He, intrigued by the sword's apparent consciousness, invited her to give it her all. As she prepared to strike, uttering, die, Hendrik effortlessly blocked her attack. Haryu was shocked that he could neutralize the dragon slayer sword's might with just one hand. Subsequently, Hendrik kicked her, she coughed and knelt down. Asserting his dominance, he proclaimed that his sword's strength surpassed hers, evident in its composition. Haryu, despite feeling defeated, refused to give up easily. She pleaded with the Dragon Slayer sword for more strength, a power potent enough to accomplish her revenge. The sword, with a wicked grin, encouraged her determination. Subsequently, Haryu emanated a menacing, powerful aura, enveloping her entire body and sword in a pink glow. Hendrik, recognizing this power as sword silk, widened his eyes in astonishment. Vowing retribution for her burned village and the resentment of the deceased Onis, Haryu attacked Hendrik with her newfound power. However, he easily evaded her strikes, cautioning her that the power she wielded surpassed her own capabilities. Hendrik warned that the sword forcibly bestowed this strength upon her, placing her in grave danger if she continued to use it. Leaping towards her, he implored Haryu to release the sword, explaining that the power acted like a consuming parasite beyond her current stage of handling. Haryu, recalling the flames that devoured her village, closed her eyes momentarily. Then, fueled by anger, a pink aura glowed fiercely in her eyes. She angrily declared her determination to release the sword only when Hendrik perished, blaming him for the village's destruction. Unleashing a barrage of silk slash attacks on the surrounding area, she vowed unforgiving retribution. Man, these cheap misunderstandings are killing me. I bet Jin Yuk is enjoying this while munching on some popcorn. Hendrik skillfully evaded her strikes, but ended up with a small cut on his cheek. Internally, he pondered, I see, do you hold a grudge against dragons too? Continuing, he remarked, Is it so intense that it's consuming you? Hendrik, having wielded the sword longer than Haryu, felt compelled to intervene. He believed he needed to steer her away from the wrong path. Focusing his energy, he readied a potent attack, warning Haryu that it would be intense, but not fatal. Haryu was stunned by the sheer might he exhibited. Hendrik then unleashed the formidable strike, resulting in a colossal explosion upon impact. Bro got hit so hard that she started dreaming. She found herself surrounded by a serene meadow adorned with stunning blue flowers, realizing it was the forest of the Oni village. Spotting a soccer ball, she picked it up when a voice called her sister Haryu, revealing a little Oni girl who requested she hold onto the ball. Haryu explained they were the village children, happily handing the ball to the young one who gratefully thanked her. However, her dream took a haunting turn as the children questioned why she was the lone survivor. It shook her deeply, leaving her bewildered. A fiery hand touched her shoulder, belonging to a burning child pleading to be saved, expressing a desire to live like her. Tears streamed down Haryu's face, her breathing becoming erratic. The haunting scene escalated as burning corpses piled up, reaching out to her, questioning her survival. Amidst this turmoil, 
how you wondered inwardly why she alone survived, and her sword responded, stating it was her destiny. It urged her to wield the Dragon Slayer's sword and carry on because revenge could only be sought through her. It reminded her that despite the Oni's demise, she must stand tall, bearing the values of kindness and vengeance. Meanwhile, Hendrik swiftly turned around, astonished at how she managed to stand after enduring his charging dragon spark attack. What a lame-ass name. How you dashed swiftly toward Hendrik, her gaze vacant. Closing in on him, she plunged the blade into his stomach. Both collapsed to the ground, revealing the sword had shattered upon impact with Hendrik. The shattered sword muttered that this was probably Haru's limit, urging her to grow stronger, to cut through him and avenge all the Oni. Concerned, Jinhyuk called out Haru and Hendrik's names, while Vulcan inquired about their well-being. Hendrik reassured them he was fine, noting that Haru had exhausted herself before stabbing him. Believing it best to let her rest, they returned to the village. Inside an apartment, Haryu lay sleeping on the bed, appearing gaunt. Observing her condition, Hendrik speculated that she might be malnourished, having repeatedly pushed herself beyond her limits. He wondered if she'd attack him upon waking. Jin Hyuk suggested she might, given her story resembled Hendrik's, possibly involving one of the dragons that ravaged her village. Hendrik reflected that the previous owner of his dragon body might have been one of the dragons that attacked her village. Accepting the burden of this body's past sins, he resolved to endure the resentment Haryu might harbor towards him. Jin Hyuk fell silent after hearing that, then requested Hendrik to accompany him. He mentioned he'd booked the entire second floor and urged Hendrik to make himself at home until Haryu woke up. Hendrik expressed gratitude but declined. He felt he didn't deserve such kindness due to the past sins of his body. Yet before he could finish, Jin Hyuk cut in sharply, exclaiming, Do you think I give a damn about you? Jin Hyuk emphasized that Haryu could only rest if Hendrik wasn't in her sight. The breeze swept into Haryu's room, stirring her awake. Feeling the wind against her skin, she opened her eyes, initially thinking she saw Jin Hyuk, but to her surprise, it was Miho who informed Jin Yuk of Haryu's awakening. Jin Yuk entered the room and inquired, Are you awake? Bro, 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 I hate people like this. Why do you have to ask such stupid questions? Like, bro, you see me awake and looking at your dumbass, so why are you asking me if I'm awake? Anyway, back to the story. Haryu responded with a yes, mentioning that her head felt stuffy. Suddenly, Miho exclaimed, Daddy's here! These words triggered Haryu once more, overwhelming her with jealousy, causing her to faint again. Uh, confused, Miho questioned if Haryu was sleeping once more. Jin Hyuk lifted Miho and warned her that she might die if she didn't change the nickname she used for him. Miho replied, Die? Miho will? From who? Jin Hyuk then cautioned her that she would die from that sister. Will Haryu overcome her jealousy? Will Jin Hyuk finally explain everything to free her from these misunderstandings? Share your thoughts in the comments. Oh, and find out what will happen in the next episode, because this shit getting good. Creating these videos requires a significant investment of time and effort. Therefore, I would greatly appreciate your support by liking and subscribing to my channel. Your support means the world to me and motivates me to continue producing high-quality content. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more, please comment to let me know your interest. Your feedback and engagement are essential in shaping the direction of future videos. Thank you for being a part of this community.